Welcome to the Communist Party USA's first ever international conference. This weekend will prove to be an important moment in the history of our party, as we host for the first time fraternal parties from around the world. As the world continues to shift away from Western hegemony and towards multipolarity, there could be no better time than now for a conference dedicated to internationalism and anti-imperialism. Internationalism has a somewhat vague definition. As communists, however, we must grasp the importance of proletarian internationalism. Without an understanding that the working class of one country shares in the same struggles as the working class of another, an understanding that we are allies instead of competitors, nationalism and false consciousness will disrupt our unity and diminish our ability to demand what is right. We must educate one another and replace division with solidarity. Within the imperialist core, communists have a unique responsibility to counter imperialist narratives propagated by our ruling class. Their attitudes towards any movement that threatens their ability to extract profit from the global south lead the nation into jingoism, militarism, and nationalism. As such, with this event, we hope to counter these narratives, foster international solidarity, and to inspire principled anti-imperialist action. During this conference, we hope to shed light on these shifts in the balance of global powers and discuss how we can best organize in opposition to imperialism. We look forward to the participation and presentations from our speakers and fraternal parties and hope this first international conference of the Communist Party USA inspires us all and gives us something to remember for years to come. Comrades and friends, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming to our second day of the Communist Party USA International Conference, Dismantling Imperialism in the 21st Century. We have over 1,400 people that are uh, signed up for it. And of course, it's also on YouTube. So again, thank you very much. And uh, we're going to have a great uh, a session today, music, cultural events, and we're going to have uh, speakers and greetings. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our first ever international conference hosted by the CPUSA. I am Dylan, your moderator for the conference committee, uh, or your moderator from the conference committee of the International Department. And today we have many more great presentations for you all, including an address from esteemed historian, Dr. Gerald Horn. Greetings from fraternal parties from all over the world cultural and artistic presentations from many talented comrades and insightful discussions with our Peace and Solidarity Commission on international struggles and what we can do here at home to help. We'd like to encourage everyone to go to redworldreview.org slash sign up and learn how they can participate in internationalist and anti-imperialist work. And you can also go to cpusa.org for more information about the party generally. Don't forget about, about our donation drive for the National Network on Cuba. Yesterday, we almost hit our $2,000 goal raising a total of $1,700 in donations. Uh, I'm not great at math, but I think that means we have 300 more to go. So remember these donations will help, buy will help buy medical equipment for Cuba through the Saving Lives campaign. If you can spare a few dollars, it would be immensely impactful and appreciated. So let's get that last 300 for the end of the day and reach our goal. Dr. Gerald Horn is the Morris Professor of History and African-American Studies at the University of Houston. He, and uh, he has author, authored over 30 books and 100 scholarly, scholarly papers and reviews during his decades of research. He received his bachelor's at Princeton, his PhD in history at Columbia, and his JD at the UC Berkeley School of Law. As an African-American from Missouri, Dr. Horn has firsthand experience with the reality of racism within the United States. As such, his research dwells into the many ways racism affects American society, culture, politics, and international relations. As a Marxist, Dr. Horn examines uh, racism within the context of labor and historical development and has written at length on settler colonialism, imperialism, and slavery, as well as on the revolutions and revolutionary movements that emerged in these conditions. Some of his best known work includes Confronting Black Jacobins, the United States, the Haitian Revolution, and the Origins of the Dominican Republic, The Counter Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. Paul Robeson, the artist as revolutionary, and Race to Revolution, the United States and Cuba during uh, slavery and Jim Crow. Additionally, he has just recently published Counter Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of U.S. Fascism, which I can highly recommend for this moment in our, in our country. 
His topic today is the link between imperialism or racism and imperialism, solidarity with social movements around the world. Please remember to submit your Q&A to the Zoom box, or if you're in the live audience, you can pass up your note card. Uh, Professor Gerald Horn, you now have the floor. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this important gathering. My task today is to sketch the link between racism and imperialism, which is akin to drawing the link between horse and carriage. In order to do so, I must advert to two profound revolutionary processes that changed the course of history. Speaking of the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, and the Russian Revolution of 1917. The revolutionary process that unfolded in the Caribbean ignited a general crisis of the entire slave system in the Americas and arguably worldwide that could only be resolved with the system's collapse, which occurred in North America in 1865. Despite the collapse of the Soviet Union, I continue to maintain that 1917 inaugurated likewise a general crisis of the capitalist system, which is responding today by lurching towards fascism and war. Unfortunately, this revolution of unpaid workers in the Caribbean has been underestimated, not least in the United States where its impact was assuredly profound. For building on the work of Karl Marx, Caribbean historians such as Walter Rodney of Guyana and Eric Williams of Trinidad, and along with Joseph Inakori of Nigeria, have outlined how the mass enslavement of Africans following the adventurism of the freebooter Christopher Columbus, ignited a pro who ignited a process of genocide against the indigenous helped to bring capitalism onto the global stage, dripping with blood from every pore. It is not accidental that following the abolition of enslavement in North America in 1865, sparked by the Haitian Revolution, the organizing of unions accelerated, as did the struggle for an eight hour day, as the presence of millions of unpaid workers served as a break and impediment for the working class as a whole. An ideology of racism consigning millions to enslavement or death grew inexor inexorably out of this inhumane system to the point that former United States ambassador to the United Nations, Andrew Young, also a former chief aide to Nobel laureate, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., argued that racism itself was, quote, invented, unquote, in the Anglosphere. Of course, elites of Holland, France, Denmark, Spain, and Portugal could well object, arguing that they too had a role in this inglorious process. Still, the rise of the British Empire, accompanied by the 1776 revolt of its bastard offspring, now known as the United States of America, took imperialism to untold levels of misery. Indeed, referring to enslaved Africans as unpaid workers helps to clarify a point that historians long have recognized, but have not teased out the implications. That is, when the time came to revolt against London's rule in 1776, this class of unpaid workers did not by and large engage in class collaboration, i.e. united with slaveholders such as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison et al. in class collaboration, class collaboration being the key to comprehending the Trump phenomenon, 75 million strong, which bids fair to take this nation over the cliff into a peculiar form of neo-fascism. Then, in August 1814, when the Redcoats torched the White House and sent President James Madison and his garrulous spouse, Dolly, fleeing into the streets one step ahead of the posse, once again, the class of unpaid workers did not engage in class collaboration and instead sought to overthrow the slaveholders' republic, then fled in the hundreds to Trinidad and Tobago, 
the birthplace of U.S. Communist Party icon Claudia Jones, where their descendants continue to reside and play prominent roles in the political economy. Indeed, although I, like many others, use the term racism quite loosely to incorporate not just the traditional notion that entire populations are somehow inferior, quote, racially, unquote, but also it should be noted that this term racism incorporates an analytically distinct idea. In the footnotes of my book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, as well as my books on Kenya and Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe and Southern Africa, I point out that during the Cold War, when African and Caribbean envoys and ambassadors were traveling to Washington regularly, the imperialists sought to devise a scheme where that, whereby these diplomats would be given buttons to wear on their lapels so that they could be distinguished from U.S. Negroes and allowed to patronize restaurants and hotels and other public accommodations where U.S. Negroes were barred. Strict racism would not have allowed, it seems to me, for this attempted distinction between Africans at home and Africans from abroad. In other words, what has unfolded in the United States is a kind of political discrimination, discrimination based on national origin, and ultimately class antagonism, seeking to punish US Negroes for rebelling against the slaveholders republic, then the Jim Crow regime, and refusing their assigned role as unpaid labor, then cheapened labor, not to mention discrimination based upon the fact of punishment against the enslaved population and their descendants, because in 1865, this unique form of property was expropriated, liquidated by the federal government in Washington without compensation to the slave owners. And if you want to make a property holder furious, expropriate their, comp expropriate their property without compensation. Now, that helped to ignite a rage of Ku Klux Klan terrorism. The cases are legion in the United States of US born Africans speaking French in stores and restaurants during the Jim Crow apartheid regime, allowing them to be treated respectfully. If one had spoken English, the result would have been different. Today, US imperialism is more than willing to collaborate with the Negro, just as Clarence Thomas of the US Supreme Court. This raises another point. In previous centuries, a Negro like Thomas marrying a Euro-American woman, which he did, that was not only illegal, but subject perhaps to capital punishment. However, as time has evolved, imperialism has become more flexible. And so today you see this flexibility, which is not necessarily new, uh, because we also recall that the defeat of a number of revolts of unpaid workers, speaking of Gabriel in Virginia in 1800 and Denmark Vesey 200 years ago in South Carolina, were both betrayed by other Negroes who then were rewarded. Still, the raw racism of what is seen as the precursor of US imperialism can be profitably witnessed in its relationship with indigenous polities. Again, the traditional interpretation is that U.S. imperialism is launched in the 1890s with the overthrow of the Hawaii kingdom and during that same decade delivering a knockout blow to the tottering Spanish empire, scooping up the Philippines, Guam, Cuba, Puerto Rico, etc. However, this narrative may obscure the relevant point that even before then, Washington was busily liquidating indigenous policies as it moved relentlessly westward across the continent. In fact, it would be fair to consider Washington as establishing a prison house of nations with only the settlers and only a slice amongst them allowed a kind of self-determination. Consider the Cherokee, for example, who occupied the Southeast quadrant of this continent in the area around what is now the Carolinas and Georgia. They sought to, ass to assimilate to settler culture, including converting to Christianity, starting plantations featuring enslaved Africans, 
dressing like the settlers sartorially, et cetera. Nonetheless, their lands and homes, some rather commodious, some mansions, were seized, and the Cherokee had to embark on the so-called Trail of Tears, transported in mass to what was called Indian Territory, what is today Oklahoma, as European settlers, some fresh off the boat, were able to seize their property and move into their mansions in some instances. After the Civil War, Cherokee enslavers were compelled to disgorge more property to their unpaid workers than their peers of European descent by several orders of magnitude. However, then in 1921, the wealth of these enriched Negroes was seized violently as a result of what has come to be called the Tulsa Massacre, perpetrated typically by a harbinger of the Trump coalition in January 6th, that is to say a collaboration across class lines by settlers and their descendants. It was near this same time that another dimension of racism unwound, this time at the Versailles Peace Conference, deciding the fate of the planet in the aftermath of World War I, a conflict, as you know, which led to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and the general crisis of capitalism and its handmaiden imperialism, imperialism, not to mention the demise of the Ottoman Empire. The yoking of racism and imperialism was illustrated at Versailles when the United States and Australia, amongst other victorious nations, refused to yield to a proposal from Tokyo, a rising imperial power in its own right, whereas the, when the Japanese envoy sought to have racial equality written to the final document. This rejection was a reflection of the growing anti-Asian sentiment in the Pacific Basin, exemplif exemplified by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 in the United States and anti-Japanese and anti-Chinese pogroms, such as that in Los Angeles in 1871, alongst the west coast of the United States, stretching from Seattle to San Diego, and not to mention Australia too. This horrific process was worsened by the post-US Civil War rise of blackbirding or the enslavement of Melanesians and Polynesians in the region, particularly in Fiji and Queensland, Australia, especially by former enslavers in the US South. In the long run, just as the Haitian Revolution was a blow against racism, the Bolshevik Revolution was a mighty blow against racism and imperialism. This is not only reflected in internal policies, which caused one US scholar to call the Soviet Union, quote, the affirmative action empire, unquote. This is not only because of Moscow's aid to African liberation. By the way, this aid preceded 1917. In the 1890s, Russia aided Ethiopia in defeating an Italian invasion an obscure point noted by the New York Times a few weeks ago in trying to explain to his readers of why there was so much pro-Moscow sentiment in the wake of the sanctions crusade uh, as a result of the Ukraine so-called special military operation. Uh, but this is also a, a result of the role of Pushkin in the 19th century, the role that he played in Russian literature and culture, uh, which has no peer in the North Atlantic bloc including the United States, which continues to contain millions of peoples of African descent. But as well, there was the rise of a US Communist Party flowing from the Bolshevik Revolution, which then led to the training in Moscow of the black attorney, William Patterson, who went on to lead the international labor defense. The ILD led the campaign to free the Scottsboro Nine, black youth in Alabama, accused falsely of rape of two Euro-American women and headed for execution before the ILD backed by Moscow launched a global campaign in their behalf, not unlike the global campaign against apartheid too backed by Moscow, which led to the election of the former communist Nelson Mandela as president in 1994. The Scottsboro case led to high court opinions concerning criminal law that are still good law, and was a gigantic step towards the 1950s erosion of Jim Crow US apartheid validated by the US Supreme Court. During the same decade, similar forces led to a burst of labor organizing 
as embodied in the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which too was a mighty blow against racism in so many ways, not least since CIO unions, such as West Coast Longshore, uh, headed by and founded by Harry Bridgen's Wellborn in Melbourne, Australia. And for a while, the National Maritime Union led by black communist Ferdinand Smith. Uh, these unions were in the vanguard of anti-racism. This was obviously too much for imperialism as one then espied Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain in London, assisted by Joseph Kennedy, the US ambassador, father of a future president, not to mention aviation hero Charles Lindbergh, seeking to cut a deal with fascism in the interest of anti-communism. In, <clears throat> in a sense, uh, this came to naught when in June 1941, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union followed in December by Tokyo's attack on Pearl Harbor. The latter led to one of the most heinous episodes in racist mass murder in world history, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945 by US imperialism incinerating thousands, tens of thousands within seconds. Certainly it would be a gross error to underestimate the racism factor when contemplating US-China relations today and what imperialism may have in store. Post-war Moscow resumed its aid to people struggling against racism and imperialism, including Koreans, Vietnamese, Indochinese more generally, Cubans, and as noted Africans. The global anti-racist and anti-imperialist movement was in contradiction with the obtaining US system of Jim Crow or US apartheid and this iniquitous system began to retreat reluctantly. However, this was a victory not without cost as Washington forced a split in the anti-Jim Crow movement, causing the NAACP to turn on the left, including its founder, W.E.B. Du Bois, not to mention the tallest tree in our forest, Paul Robeson, not to mention communist leaders such as the aforementioned Claudia Jones, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Ferdinand Smith, Ben Davis, William Patterson. Of course, Smith and Jones were subjected to a growing anti-immigrant ethos as they were deported, in Smith's case to his native Jamaica. Certainly we should not forget that anti-immigrant sentiment then as now has severely impacted those in this nations with roots to the South. This forced split weakened the movement in this nation, creating fertile soil for the rise of right-wing populism and class collaboration, which reared its ugly head on January 6, 2021, and bids fair to surge in the near future once more. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in the United States, excuse me, in 1991, excuse me, US imperialism thought it would bestride the planet like a colossus, somehow forgetting that a key to the collapse was a deal cut with China in 1972, leading to massive foreign direct investment into this Asian nation, creating a juggernaut that imperialism is now seeking to derail, in part by shifting production to India, which only will complicate Washington's devilish plans. And as we meet on September 11, 2022, we would be remiss if we failed to note the anniversary of US imperialism's disastrous alliance with the religious zealots in Afghanistan, which will be de bedeviling Washington for decades to come. Given the foregoing, what is to be done? In the past, US communist leader Eugene Dennis was posted for a time in the Philippines, contributing his expertise and counsel to that movement. Why can't US cadre be posted to Swaziland or Indian comrades posted to the United States. In the past, the US Communist Party used to assess its members an extra assessment for Southern solidarity, recognizing the importance of this benighted region for the future of the nation and ultimately the world. Given the strength and perniciousness of US imperialism, the major threat to international peace and security, why can't sibling parties make an assessment on behalf of the US movement. This can take many forms, such as bulk pur pur purchases of international publishers' books for political education, 
which would be mutually advantageous. The current US president himself has spoken of the specter of fascism stalking the United States in the form of that cross-class collaboration that sought to execute a coup on January 6, 2021. Fascism would not just be a disaster for the working class of the United States and oppressed nationalities more generally, but would be a catastrophe for the international community. As such, the international community has a dedicated interest in ensuring that fascism does not arrive on these shores. As such, as with the Scottsboro case of the 1930s, when there were countless demonstrations at US embassies and corporations overseas, why not revive this program with a focus on US racism, which helps to fuel fascism, taking advantage of the mass protests that erupted globally in the wake of the killing on camera of black worker George Floyd? Why not hold an international conference on the danger presented by US imperialism and its handmaiden fascism? Holding such a conference in Toronto or Havana or Cyprus or Cape Town. In the 1980s, there was organized a group called CISPUS, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. Why not a Committee in Solidarity with the working class of the United States or the people of the United States that focuses on anti imperialism, anti fascism? Why not arrange a series of Zoom lectures by US fascists, US anti fascists, anti fascists? with the honoraria contributed to the United States Communist Party and or anti-fascist allies. This is simply a brief litany of what is to be done given your collective intelligence. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Uh, we'll now be opening the floor to questions from the audience. Hey, uh, thank you. Very great speech. Uh, my question is, um, the USA is obviously a settler, col settler colonial state. And uh, with the African descendants uh, of those who were enslaved, still being segregated today in the Black Belt, and the indigenous nations that were demolished uh, by the settler colonial regime. What is the future of the USA in terms of, restolen, in terms of returning the stolen land stolen by the settlers? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, I think that in some ways that's already in motion. Uh, there is a significant movement focusing on the question of land, not only in the indigenous community, but also in the black community as well. And I think that ultimately the resolution of this question will depend, generally speaking, on the global correlation of forces. That is to say the extent to which we can mobilize globally an anti-fascist, anti-imperialist worldwide movement. And likewise, the extent to which we can mobilize domestically an anti-fascist and anti-imperialist movement. Uh, you may know that there are organizations that are quite active, particularly in the international arena on this score. Uh, when the Pope uh, visited Canada uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, he was peppered with questions with regard to reparations to the, with regard to reparations to the indigenous. Uh, there are delegations of the US indigenous as well who have engaged in consultations with the Holy See. So even though I think there is a lengthy, uh, torturous, serpentine path ahead of us, uh, I am confident that at some point in the future, perhaps in our lifetimes, uh, we can deliver justice to the indigenous population in the first instance. So we do have a question from our audience, Dr. Horn, um, and this audience member on Zoom is wanting to know um, a good where a good start is to learning specifically about African-American Marxist theory. <laughs> well, 
I assume my remarks uh, have been taped. And if you pluck out some of the names that I've mentioned, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, such as Paul Robeson, uh, I would be engaging in a bout of false modesty if I failed to mention my own work, particularly the work beginning with the settler invasion in the 16th century, going through the 17th century, through the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, up to the present. Um, I mentioned, of course, in my remarks, the work on capitalism and slavery by Eric Williams and how Europe underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney and Joseph Inakori of the University of Rochester of Nigerian descent in his book, Africans and the Industrial Revolution in England. So there's a plethora of work uh, out there to be perused. Uh, no deficit, I'm happy to say. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have a live question? Do you want to go to Zoom? Okay, so let's do one more Zoom question. This one for you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Horn, is what direction do you think the Black Lives Matters movement will take in order to achieve its goals? So this but, is a question, yeah, go ahead. That's a very good question. I've uh, spoken on that question a number of times. I mean, first of all, uh, the good news is that the Black Lives Matter movement, particularly in cities like Los Angeles and other cities analogous to that Pacific Ocean based metropolis have done tremendous work in, in terms of spotlighting uh, police terrorism in terms of trying to uh, reform, revamp, sometimes even defund the police. But as I've also said uh, in the past, I think that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, made a creative adaptation uh, to recent history. Recall that when there have been centralized movements, such as the Black Panther Party, for example, uh, what happens is that the US authorities try to decapitate that movement and engage in a reign of terror directed at the leadership of leading, leaving the body without a head. And so creatively adapting to those conditions, the Black Lives Matter movement has been decentralized. But there is a kind of problem involved with the decentralized movement. It may help to shed light on some of the stories that I'm sure your audience is familiar with, with certain kinds of financial mismanagement within the Black Lives Matter movement and the wastage of resources. Uh, when I made that proposal for a conference uh, to take place in Toronto or Havana or Cape Town or Cyprus, I had in mind the Black Lives Matter movement uh, because I had in mind a kind of resuscitation uh, of the international labor defense and its predecessor, excuse me, its successor, which was the Civil Rights Congress, which like the Black Panther Party was driven into liquidation by the US authorities in that case in 1956. And so I think that uh, if we are able to do our job in terms of recreating a global anti-fascist, anti-imperialist movement, I think that the benefit will also redound to the Black Lives Matter movement. So uh, we also have time for one more question from a live audience member, Dr. Horn. Um, so comrade, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Horn, for your uh, great uh, presentation. I have to stand up a little bit on my toes. Um, I, I have a question. I, I was very interested in police violence in the Caribbean. Um, and I was shocked to learn that the rate of police killing of uh, civilians is in Jamaica 10 times what it is in the United States. And of course, I've never seen a white Jamaican police officer. And uh, there's sometimes talk in, in the United States of hiring more black officers as a, as a, as a solution uh, to the problem of racist police violence. And I wondered if you could reflect a little bit on that kind of violence in the Caribbean right now, especially in 
Uh, Jamaica seems to be the worst, um, but I wonder if you could reflect on that. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation this morning. Well, I would say this, so once again, with regard to hemispheric problems, uh, we cannot let US imperialism off the hook. There was a recent book published, I think it was called River of Iron, and it talked about an analogous problem, a problem to which you uh, noted in Jamaica, that's also prevalent in Mexico. Uh, that is to say, uh, gun violence, particularly not only gun violence by the authorities, but by so-called gangs. But a lot of this has to do with this thriving industry in the United States of uh, producing handguns, uh, which has led once again to a global movement to try to put uh, sanctions on the U.S. gun manufacturers, and in fact, a, a domestic movement as well. You probably heard about the recent attempts to make it more difficult to buy weapons with a credit card in order to slow down the proliferation of handguns. And you have a similar problem in Jamaica. And you have a similar problem in Haiti. Uh, you have a similar problem in El Salvador. And in fact, in, in El Salvador, as you probably know, uh, the so-called gang problem, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of members was basically made in USA. Uh, that is to say, with regard to the war in El Salvador, which I made reference to a few moments ago in talking about CISPUS, and with uh, many fleeing from El Salvador to Southern California, and then being incorporated into so-called gangs and then being deported from the United States into El Salvador, uh, where many have created a havoc. And so likewise, with regard to imperialism and the depredations that it inflicts upon the de developing countries like uh, Jamaica, like Haiti, uh, you have the deportation of Jamaicans and Haitians uh, who learn at the knee of gangs in the United States, such as places like Los Angeles, and bring uh, those malevolent skills back to the island. Certainly, I would not draw the conclusion, which I'm sure you would not do, that the fact that you have police killings in Jamaica and everybody's Black means that police killings disproportionately of Black people in the United States, somehow uh, that elides the question of racism. In fact, I think it deepens the question of racism, it deepens the question of imperialism, and it also uh, puts an extra burden upon us to try to restrain these negative forces by building a mass anti-imperialist, anti-fascist force that has global dimensions. Dr. Gerald Horn, thank you so much for your participation today. We deeply appreciate your time uh, and, and taking the moment to answer our questions. Um, we'll now move on to play a handful of cultural videos received from members of our party. Greetings, comrades, and welcome to this important conference on dismantling imperialism in the 21st century. My name is Alvaro Che, and I'm from Texas. Uh, the following video is a performance of one of my songs called Checkpoints and Borders. I wrote this song from the perspective of someone who has to leave their home, their country, and find somewhere new uh, in an unwelcoming land. Uh, of course, imperialism is at the root of the movement of people across borders and the treatment of people once they arrive. So for me, uh, dismantling imperialism means that our humanity doesn't stop at a wall or a border or a checkpoint. Thank you for being here and for listening. Of everyone I 
it home That border I just can't cross sheep for the International Conference Against Imperialism. While us sheep wonder if we will amount to anything, the corporations count us to sleep, wearing our home and bones like bling and bringing us down to hear us weep. They erode away at our positivity and they tell us it's not that deep. Optimism used to be my middle name and now you're lucky if you even meet realism. Pessimism seems to be more comfortable here than I recall. I tried to kick them out but they guilt tripped me with the thought of houselessness and they told me to throw away those nuanced isms. Look at the time, it's almost fall. This is what happens when you spend so much time learning to crawl that the ruling class around you learns to run and laughs in your face thinking you can be a class conscious race. Meanwhile, they're calling us dumb. And I'll only continue to be naive if that means one day the sheep either follow in my steps or I'll only stop doing that if the corporations stop placing bets on our lives and blaming us for their gambling addiction. Meanwhile, they're only winning because they're cheating and beating us dry with no end or restrictions. Thank you. Hello, this is David Roberts in Portland, Oregon, and uh, I am very glad to be virtually participating in this conference, Dismantling Imperialism in the 21st Century. It's never been a more urgent task than it is now, and um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, contribute a song here, uh, which is um, about, uh, well, it's about writing the narrative, who controls the historical narrative. Uh, whoever controls the narrative uh, uh, has a lot of influence in uh, how people see the world today and uh, and what, what the possibilities are. And uh, so the, uh, the capitalists are always working hard to rewrite history. And so uh, s those of us who uh, are writers uh, in one form or another are often uh, engaged in exactly the same uh, task of uh, writing about history rather than rewriting it uh, and, uh, and sharing the stories that are so important for people to be aware of. Um, and uh, this song here is, uh, seemed like an appropriate one for the occasion, and it's about um, the liberation of the 
the women from the Ravensbrück concentration camp who were on a death march to Berlin at the time when they were liberated by the Red Army and spontaneously broke out in song. It's a true story about uh, my friend Katerina Jakob's grandmother, Katerina Jakob, um, and what happened on May 1st, 1945. So I'll leave you with that and hope to see you next time when this conference happens in um, whether it's a post-imperial world, at least maybe we can have the conference in person somewhere and not on the internet. But um, yeah, take care, keep on keeping on. And I'll sign off for now. Katarina Jakob, long before she took that name, was organizing workers in Hamburg just the same. Organizing beneath the flag of deepest red, a new dawn of peace and freedom clearly shining in her head. Katarina Jakob first was sent to jail. When the trappings of democracy all began to fail She was frequently arrested in and out of custody When her first husband was in hiding from the Nazis Katarina Jakob was acquitted of a crime But the Gestapo had the last word They weren't fitted with her this time She was sent to Ravensbrook A killing hunger at her side She heard of the execution How her second husband died For Katarina Jakob The end was close at hand She was on a death march With a ragged starving band Marching through a forest Being led by the SS What would happen? Hours later seemed impossible to guess When the sun rose the next morning It was the first of May And they all sang the Internationale They all sang the Internationale Katarina Jakob thought about her children and the friends and comrades taking care of them Not knowing yet if any of them survive Not knowing that soon she'd see her daughters both alive Katarina Jakob watched the German soldiers fleeing Streaming from the east, that's what she was seeing Allied bombers flew above them, she thought they all might die And then soon there was the silence of all the SS men When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May And they all sang the Internationale They all sang the Internationale Katarina Jakob saw red flags flapping in the breeze above the Russian tanks and she fell upon her knees and so many different voices in so many different tongues sang the most beautiful song that could ever have been sung in German, Lithuanian in Polish and in Dutch A myriad of melodies Has never had been such In Russian and in Yiddish Italian and French Emerging from the forest Beneath the trench When the sun rose The next morning It was the first of May And they all sang The Internationale When the sun rose The next morning It was the first of May and they all sang the Internationale they all sang the Internationale Volker hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht Volker hört die Signale auf zum letzten Gefecht Die Internationale erkämpft das Menschenrecht. Thank you very much. Next up, we welcome a presentation on the Hello Comrade Project 
given by, given by Arturo Cambron. Arturo is a representative on the National Committee of the Party, longtime activist in Southern California, member of our international department and head of the Hello Comrade Project. Welcome Arturo and Eric, you both have the floor. Hello comrades. Greetings from La Casa Roja, the Red House here in Los Angeles. We first of all, we want to thank the International Department for organizing and inviting us to share our project with you. And um, we just wanted to quickly say that this, pro how this project is connected to communist internationalism and anti-imperialism. Um, I, I think for me, it, it, it's one thing to hear about um, uh, how important the anti-imperial struggle is. And another thing to understand, really understand um, that we're all connected um, and, and that in order to, to um, be connected as members of the working class, it's, it's important to really understand that, particularly when we're working within the belly of the beast. So anyway, so we wanted to share our, our video. Uh, this is um, a video of our first uh, two trips to Portugal and then to Chile. So Mr. Conductor, roll them. Oh, that was fun. Which are you on, boy? Which side are you on, no matter what? Which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on, no matter what? I'm with the Gita on the Yano, I'm with Rudy Lozano. I'm full of war without quarters and a better tomorrow. I'm with mothers on the move, I'm with sisters on the rise. I'm with La Peña del Bro, keeping culture alive. I'm with the kids of the Mafe, watching the beat battle, me mugging all these yuppies and shorts and brown sandals. So what is the Hello Comrade project? It actually had some very humble beginnings. It started by John and I having chats, talking about, hey, did you hear what's happening in Italy? The Communist Party has been voted into power in this community and they're doing this. Have you heard the cooperatives and the collectives that are happening in Argentina or South Africa? And so we said, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually get a delegation of comrades to go and visit these places and see them? And so we said, let's go for it. So once we got the okay from the party leadership, we really started to focus in on creating a mission statement. We wanted to be very clear in terms of what is it that we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to engage in like, what does it actually feel like and taste like and smell like to be in the trenches of that country? What are the opportunities, the challenges? What do they eat when they get together and celebrate? What music do they listen to when they're organizing? And what are they like on a personal level? And I think that was what we felt would be very engaging for people, activists in our country to understand that even though this is a worldwide movement, it's quite different and it's quite particular to every country. And it would be very exciting to find out what does it feel like to be in South Africa as a communist or China, where you're actually in control of the government is very different from where maybe you're underground. And so this is what we wanted to do and to share. Mark says though, that everything is in constant motion. And that's also true with this project. Originally, we just wanted to go over there and document these kind of things, but we soon realized that the project had much more potential. We wanted to engage now in the battle of ideas because in our country, there's so many misconceptions about communism or what a communist is, that communists are anti-democratic, that as a society, they're very authoritarian and the government tells people what to do. And so people have no say so and so forth. And we realized that as we travel to these places, the exact opposite is true, that there is no other group that is involved and has skin in the game than people in the communist parties and socialist parties all around the world. And so we wanted to be able to answer those misconceptions, those questions. In Bolivia, the indigenous movement under Evo Morales made some very impressive gains. 
In Chile, the progressive women's movement is front and center carrying the banner of change in their country. All of this is very inspirational. The role of art and culture that they place in Chile and Portugal, I think is really inspiring. You know, to see young people doing murals and taking on a project of saying, we're going to commit a hundred murals between the day that we were there to September 1st to promote the new democratic constitution. So all of these kind of things is there's no better way to answer all of these people that say all of these stereotypes types than to show them and so we're very excited about that part of the project. We were very excited to go to Portugal on our very first pilot trip and I think it was exciting because we didn't know what to expect and I remember the first thing that struck us when we were walking through the streets of Lisbon was the number of billboards and posters and flags promoting Communist Party candidates. They were everywhere. And I think this is a reflection of the importance that the Communist Party of Portugal places on participating in the electoral struggle. Once we got settled in, we met with a party leadership at their building where we were introduced to Miguel, who became our host guide to the Avanti Festival. It's really hard to put in words what one feels when we walk in there. It's uh, such an um, impressive vision and you see tens of thousands of people in this huge open space it's like a huge park that the party had bought i hadn't told you that before they own the land in there anyway so it's a project that they do three-day festival every day it's like coachella over here in california it has that same feel typically when we were there this year they still had covid restrictions but they were limited to forty-five thousand people a day and so they had to clamp down on who can go typically on non COVID restricted years, they average between 100 and 150,000 a day. And so this is a reflection of how well accepted the party is in Portugal. And it's wonderful because they have something for everybody. They have a nursery section for the toddlers. They have games. They have a, a merry-go-round. They have things for teenagers. They have playgrounds for teenagers. They have art exhibit, they have theater, they have forums. It is three days of non-stop action. Like I said, it's really hard to describe the feeling as a communist to walk in there and see families walking in with their strollers and with a flag and a hammer and sickle and people dancing while they go in there. It shatters stereotypes and that's I think what's really important in the sense that it's a reflection of the country itself. It's a reflection of the community because you have black, brown, white, young people, older people all coming together in a peaceful setting, in a cultural setting, and it's just so uplifting. You know, I think our host guide, Miguel, gave the perfect description of the goals and the purpose of the Avanti Festival. Yes. We want Avant Festival to be a microcosmos of the society we want to build. And that's it. This is the place where friendship, solidarity have a residence, a permanent residence. For the three days, it's like living in a communist society. <laughs> we found out that the party has something like 32 community centers in Lisbon alone. They took us to two of their projects. One of them was this cultural center slash restaurant. And what's really funny is because this is a building that was abandoned but originally belonged to a duchess. They turned it into a restaurant. They have 27 employees which get paid higher than the national average. They're guaranteed all rights. The party and other volunteers run the management component at zero profit. They're all volunteers. So all the money that's raised from the restaurant after paying the employees goes to funding classes, theater, art, meetings, labor organizing. And so it's funny how the money coming from the very wealthy of Lisbon is going to fund all these very progressive actions and organizations. So it's wonderful. The other project that they showed us was they're running also their own school for children very progressive where they highly involve the parents and the community so it's worked under a different model and i think if you see some of these pictures there it's actually quite inspirational there were so many things that stood out but i think what i learned about our experience from portugal was the level of discipline within the party that i hadn't seen in other places before i think it was the fact that everybody there was 
cooperating and working so tightly that the party has a line, has a structure, and how efficiently they work. That's something that I really stood out. You know, Eric, I would really like to hear your opinion. You're fairly new to this project. Can you tell me what you felt when we first approached you about joining this project? Yeah, the very first thing that happened was that I missed a call from you and I listened to the voicemail and you said, Eric, there's this project that we're working on and I think you might be interested. So give me a call back. And you just left it at that and the voicemail stopped and I immediately called you back. I was thinking to myself, what could this be? Like, what's going on here? And you told me about the Hello Comrade project. I had no idea what to expect, but I was really excited to know that CPUSA was an active part of the international communist movement and working together with our comrades internationally. And that it would be an opportunity to show folks back in the U.S. that Communist Party USA is recognized by our international fraternal parties as the communist party that's, that's of the USA. True. So that was really cool to know. I had a very theoretical understanding of Marxism-Leninism as a pretty new member of the party. I joined in August of 2021. So I think it was important to see that Marxism-Leninism wasn't just a bunch of theory, but was something that people were actively applying. And that's something that I definitely saw I just remember you all talking a lot about the Avante Festival in Portugal and all of these amazing experiences that you had. I knew that I was about to have all kinds of really cool experiences, but I didn't know what they were yet. They hadn't happened yet. Our first day of the project in Chile could have been the entire trip. The Communist Party of Chile understood exactly why we were there, and they made sure our schedule was full. We began by visiting Tres y Cuatro Alamos, a concentration camp where communists, leftists, and suspected communists were tortured, imprisoned, and murdered under the fascist Pinochet dictatorship. Our point of contact from the Communist Party of Chile, Paul Hammer, was himself imprisoned there, and he recounted horrific memories as we walked through and bore witness. And we learned that today, community activists are working to convert Tracy Cuatro Alamos into a historical site of remembrance. Then we met Oscar Plandiura, a highly acclaimed sculptor and painter who welcomed us into his studio and showed us a few of his majestic works made from stone. We met with Gustavo Arias, a hip-hop artist, muralist, and two-term communist city council member who performed communist freestyle and spoke with us about movement building. And then we drove to the home of Patricia Recabaren Gonzalez, whose two brothers, pregnant sister-in-law and father, were all disappeared by the Pinochet dictatorship's secret police on a single day in April of 1976. We finished the day at the prestigious Writers' Society of Chile, which meets to read and discuss revolutionary poetry, and which was formerly under the direction of Pablo Neruda. Many poems were shared, and Paul from Hello Comrade read a favorite of his own in English and in Spanish and the founders of the world-renowned music group Inti Limani happened to be there and played a couple of their songs as we all sat around a conference table. But that was just the first day. There would be seven more. I was overwhelmed by the emotional magnitude of the experience that day, and I felt how important it would be to use as many photos and videos as possible to raise consciousness about the rich history, thriving present, and exciting future that the communist movement is advancing. One of the most impactful moments for me was meeting with Daniel Jadwe, the mayor of Recoleta, who's a member of the Communist Party of Chile and who ran for and nearly won the presidency in 2021. We had an hour-long conversation at his office where he talked about how socialist consciousness develops through working-class victories. When we work with the people, we must work with the people to make them to understand the capacity that they have to transform their environment to satisfy their need. If we reach that, we're going to have all the votes. And then we saw for ourselves the fruits of just a few of these major achievements. Recoleta's People's Pharmacy, People's Optical Care, Bookshop, and public housing that costs an average of $100 a month for a three-bedroom apartment. The costs of these developments were cut to the bare minimum so the people could get the maximum benefit including an average of 80% off for medical care. And the public housing, mainly geared towards single mothers and other marginalized people, offers a three- or four-year contract while tenants are assisted in getting work and life skills so that they can transition out and allow a new family to arrive. But these projects are not charity. Danielle Hadwe made clear that working-class consciousness, socialist consciousness, support for the Communist Party of Chile, and his own electoral success is building not by gifting things upon the working class, 
But by allowing these projects to develop and arise from the working class itself, side by side with the Communist Party, so that people can see for themselves that this is real. And then it was time for us to get ready for the May Day March in Santiago. We painted a banner of our own, inspired by the vibrant style developed by the Brigada Ramona Para, the Communist Party of Chile's historic mural collective. And when we arrived at the march, we joined the Communist Party of Chile's Young Communist League to paint a mural of their own. I'm honored and inspired to have been a part of the Hello Comrade Project's trip to Chile. This remarkable collaboration was made possible by the generous hospitality and organizational strength of our comrades from the Communist Party of Chile. I returned with a far deeper understanding of how Marxism-Leninism is actively applied to transform the conditions and advance the interests of the working class. I feel the optimism and solidarity of the international communist movement, our fraternal parties and comrades, and I am so grateful to be a part of the strengthening struggle for a socialist future and a better world. was a wonderful presentation from Hello Comrades. Thank you guys for taking the time to put that together. Uh, we're going to go into a Q&A session. Uh, first, we will start with uh, a live question from the audience. Comrade, you have the floor. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering in particular if the Young Communist League is taking an initiative to have more people-to-people -people, uh, connections like this. Um, particular experiences at the World Federation of Democratic Youth um, World Festival, and I was also wondering if there's any plans for another festival like that in the near future. Yeah, before we start, I want to uh, introduce two other members that are jo joining us. So, Paul and Elias. Hello, comrades. And Hello, we're comrades. still missing another one. He sh should be here shortly. <laughs> but anyway, uh, anybody would like to answer? Uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, as far as the Young Communist League specifically is? Well, from what I, uh, you know, we had a really uh, good talk with uh, people from the YCL and it's really uplifting to see uh, the energy and the commitment and the conviction and these people are so bright. We, I, I understand that the, the YCL there is very active in terms of connecting internationally. Um, I don't know any of the specifics in terms of like when the next meeting is going to be or what the next conference is, but definitely um, they're on top of it. They participate in every event, both both national and international. Great. So we'll have uh, another question from the Zoom audience. And this question is, given what Gerald Horn hinted at on internationalism and exchanging comrades, any plans for Hello Comrades to sponsor CP members from another country to spend time in the US? Anybody want to answer that? We, we actually, we have talked about that. Yeah, uh, the, you know, the, remember this is a pilot tr uh, program right now. So we're barely on phase two. We have one last pilot trip. But after that, we've had discussion exactly on that. Wouldn't it be great to also uh, invite them and participate, and we would host them here. We would show them what it's like to be in the trenches uh, of, of struggle in the U.S. So yes, uh, that is part of our longer goal, um, but it hasn't been defined yet. First, we want to make sure we, we cover these three uh, pilot trips, and then we'll, we'll fine tune it. All right, so we've got another question from a live audience member. Comrade, you have the floor. Comrades, I'm a little short for this mic, but um, I wanted to ask you if you could um, kind of highlight the process because what we see is the results of hard work. Did you uh, in talk about what was the process to get these uh, parties at the level that they are right now in the Avanti Festival? you know, the building of that festival of 100,000 plus attendees, and also, you know, the mayor and the, uh, the city council members and the discipline that you saw in uh, Chile. Can you talk about the, the process that, that uh, happened there to get to that point? Thank you. 
Well, the process was a coordination uh, through the international department. Um, so kind of what you saw in the video was the end product, but it was a lot of coordination, a lot of organization, and a lot of support um, from you know our international partners and you know here. Um, one of the things that they did, what, what, like what Paul was saying, that once we got it, we send a letter, a request of what the project's like, then they send us a contact person. And so through that contact person, we did the, the fine tuning. But, uh, but it's very, like you were, you were saying, it's, there is a process, there is a protocol of doing this. So you just, it's just you know, don't show up and here we are. <laughs> but rather, um, you know, they took it up with their central committee. You know, they brought our project in and because a lot of these people, um, these great leaders are in the central committee, they were able to uh, commit right then and there that saying, yeah, I can host them and yes, we could do this and yes, we could do that. So it, it's uh, like I said, and it's a reflection of how tightly organized they are and very, very structured, um, very impressive. Yeah, I wanted to say something quickly about that too, which is that we had a chance, at least in Chile, to meet with, with their international department for like an hour or so. And, and we saw, uh, like Arturo just talked about, like, like you know, we, um, we saw, or you, you heard in the video, that that um, kind of finely, finely honed and finely tuned and very, very cohesive um, uh, um, thing is, is so, so clear to see um, when, when, when um, the international department is working so, so closely and so tightly and like such a well-oiled machine. If, if I may, I'm sorry, I, I maybe I wasn't clear with my question. But my, my main question is, you know, we, we see the Avanti Festival, we see a mayor, a Communist Party mayor, but the process of getting a Communist Party mayor in office, the process of developing such a discipline in the ranks of the Communist parties, did you talk about those things? Uh, I, I'm sorry, the question wasn't clear enough at the beginning. Okay, I mean, does um, anyone else want to? Yeah, I... um, it, absolutely true. Uh, when we met with um, the mayor of Recoleta, he told us the collective decided that they were going to run a candidate, and it was they they had a 10-year project. It was a 10-year project where they were going to start and build and build connections and build projects and so forth. So the ultimate goal after the 10 years was to get uh, get somebody elected right there. They actually did it a lot faster than, than the 10 years. I think it was after six years. Mm -hmm. But yes, it was meticulous. It was well thought. It was organized. And that happened in every facet of the, the Chilean experience. All right. Uh, do we want to do another Zoom question? All right. So we will move on. Um, before we wrap this up. I just want to give a round of applause to Hello Comrades for their contribution. Thank you so much, Comrades, for supporting your program, and we're excited to see where it goes in the future. Uh, we will now uh, have a presentation from our party's own Emil Sheppers, the, formal, the former international secretary of our party and member of the Peace and Solidarity Commission, he will discuss the trends of imperialism in the 21st century. Emil, we now give you the floor. Thank you, Dylan. Can everybody hear me? Okay, very good. Well, this is a beautiful event on the second day. Such an honor to be on the same panel as Gerald Horn and other great people. But it's a sad day because it's an anniversary of a terrorist crime. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to September 11, 1973, when uh, uh, US imperialism instigated and supported a fascist, fascist coup against the legally elected president of Chile, Dr. Salvador Allende. And I know about this because I met many of the Chilean refugees in Chicago who came after that. Uh, interestingly enough, the United States refused to let any Communist Party members come here at the time. But uh, speaking about imperialism, uh, of course, is natural for our party. It's a feature which distinguishes our line 
and our activities from other some other tendencies self-defined as socialist. Uh, imperialism and anti-imperialism is a very central part of our concern. A starting point for anybody seeking to understand imperialism is Lenin's 1916 book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Recommend all read it. In this book, Lenin outlined the features of 20th century capitalism uh, at the begin in the right in the middle of the First World War. First of all, free trade is replaced by huge monopolies that work, that operate on an international scale. Secondly, finance capital grows exponentially and combines in the dominant position with industrial capital, and we may add all other forms of capital. Thirdly, not just goods, but capital itself is exported all over the world, and all the poorer countries fall under the subordination of transnational capital. For Lenin, imperialism is not just a feature of 20th century capitalism, but is the proper name for 20th century capitalism itself. Capitalism is imperialism and imperialism is capitalism at the national, international scale in the 20th century. And this has not changed in the 21st century. After the triumph of the 1917 October Revolution and the rise of the USSR and the Comintern, the anti-colonial freedom movements in colonized and semi-colonized countries, including South Africa, where I was born, uh, increasingly saw communism and the communist movement as not just a source of inspiration and ideas, but also of material support for their struggles against the colonial powers and the wealthy capitalist states. This tendency increased after the Second World War and the coming of the power to power of socialist governments in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, the German Democratic Republic, Bulgaria, Albania, and Yugoslavia. Shortly after the Second World War, there were socialist revolutions in China, Korea, Vietnam, Laos, and Cuba, and strong anti-imperialist movements influenced by Marxism, Leninism, and many other countries around the world. The leaders of the powerful imperialist systems and states made it their business to undermine the existing socialist states and block any social advances in other countries. Method use, methods that imperialism used to block socialist movements and maintain economic and political control in the newly, over the newly independent uh, in poorer countries, as Kwame Nkrumah put it, uh, neocolonialism, included everything from pouring foreign aid money into those countries, generally channeling the foreign aid to groups that opposed socialism, right-wing organizations. And we have, can of course, list many examples, but for example, USAID, the National Endowment for, the, for Democracy. Uh, it included assassinations and direct military intervention, of course, just destabilization and overthrow of progressive governments as happened in Chile. Uh, uh, in 1973. All of, the, in our own times, labor union, uh, well, certain, certain, uh, at that time, certain labor union leaders, cultural figures, the media, academic, and in our own time, the internet and social media have all been marshaled in a, an organized way to block the advance of socialist ideas and communist uh, activities. Uh, now, since the collapse of socialism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe in 1991, both the remaining socialist countries and pro-socialist people movements in the global South have been facing very great difficulties since they lost access to fair, fair trade relationships and material and ideological support, or at least it was very greatly released. 
reduced. The neoliberal package of free, i.e. monopoly dominated trade, elimination of labor and environmental protection regulations, privatization of public resources, and austerity are the prices that poorer countries are forced to pay to survive in the 21st century economic and political environment. Mechanisms include trade sanctions, such as Dr. The, uh, such as the representative of the Communist Party of Ch Chile described to us yesterday, uh, so-called free trade agreements, such as CAPTA DR, which includes the Central American countries in the Dominican Republic, uh, and structural adjustment programs such as those promoted by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, both of which entities are, of course, imperialist controlled. The poor of the countries find themselves trapped in unpayable debt with dire consequences should they default. And they have to keep themselves in the good graces of the private bond rating agencies, uh, such as Moody's, Standard and Poor's and Fitch. Uh, even to be able to get any de developmental financing in the international bond market. So it's a web of, of uh, restraints and controls, controlled by no monopoly capital and supported and organized by the imperialist states, principally the United States. Let's not forget that the United States is the main one by far. There are the private equity funds such as Elliott Management, uh, but they buy up sovereign debt of poor countries at discounted prices, and then they try to force those countries to pay them the full amount of the original value of the debt. We all remember, I think, how Elliott Management managed to get a court in Ghana, of all places, to actually seize a warship of the Argentine Navy uh, a few years ago uh, in this horrible dynamic. Our late comrade and commandante Fidel Castro Ruz uh, tried to convince the, in, the, indebted, the, the debtor countries that they should boycott payment of the international debt, the, the unpayable debt, but this did not happen at the time. And since then, the sovereign debt of the poorer countries have continued to grow at a rate faster than that of the wealthier countries. And recently, the United Nations released statistics showing that under the conditions of the pandemic, this has increased. That is to say that poorer countries are getting more indebted faster than the, the richer countries. Of the greatest importance is, is the predominance of the dollar in international trade. This fact has been effectively used by US imperialism against socialist Cuba. Even in the conditions of the panic, Cuba has been impeded from buying life-saving healthcare materials in the world market because US law, including the many new sanctions imposed on, on Cuba under the Trump administration in the United States, uh, block sales of many things that are absolutely essential. And Cuba can't buy much on the basis of its own currency because it's not hard currency and therefore its use for international trade is severely limited. There are efforts underway to change the situation. There's discussion among the BRICS countries that's been going on for a while. And of course, the dynamic rise of the economy, rise of the economy of the People's Republic of China leads to the real possibility that Yuan become an alternative hard currency. This is one of the things that no doubt is causing imperialism's heavy focus on confronting and, and restricting China right now. So does this impact the workers in the United States? It most certainly does in all, all in a negative way. By keeping poor countries poor in a world dominated by international monopolies and international trade, Imperialism motivates U.S. employers to move operations overseas in search of cheapest labor possible, thus exercising downward pressure on wages, benefits, and working conditions in the United States. 
Secondly, the massive, massive super profits created for, thus for the wealthiest people in the United States greatly increase the inequality, inequality in our own country. And since wealth and power in capitalism are fungible, that is to say they can be easily converted the one thing into the other, it, it erodes democracy even more. And this is one of the bases for the possibilities of fascism that have risen so, risen so dramatically in, in the United States in the last couple of years. This stage of capitalism is creating multiple crises which affect workers and other ordinary folk everywhere. Suffice it to mention the climate crisis, uh, which is very much a pro product of the late capitalist mode of production. What is to be done? Professor Horn asked that and I ask it too. Uh, first of all, the last words of the Communist Manifesto are workers for all nations unite. You cannot fight against capitalism without fighting against 21st century imperialism. And the struggle against imperialism is the same thing as the struggle against capitalism. Uh, this needs to be understood. And above all, we need a far larger and stronger anti-imperialist and peace movement in this country, encompassing all fields of political activity. How can this be built? New opportunities for building this are arising especially among young, young people in this country. Uh, the surge of new labor organizing is just one manifestation of this. For many years, it, has, it was particularly hard to get labor on board anti-imperialist activities and movements. But these young, young workers who are involved in the new organizing do not have those prejudices and do not have those restrictions. So that's a very, positive thing. And of course, there are many other uh, movements going on, the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, others. And so we are op optimistic in spite of all the horrors that imperialism inflicts on us every day. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Comrade Shepherds. We will now open the floor to discussion. Uh, first, we have a question from the audience. Uh, this question is, uh, could Emil describe the growth of anti-imperialist economic organizations around the world that are challenging the current IMF World Bank hegemony? Uh, yes, that's true in every country in the world. Uh, the uh, reason that we see some panicky reaction from imperialist leaders is precisely that. You know, the, the laws of, of Marxism-Leninism cannot be abolished by corporate decisions or uh, votes in Congress or presidential executive orders. Uh, it's very hard though, you know, we just saw in Chile the situation in which a very progressive constitutional uh, redo was defeated by a plebiscite. And in other countries, we run into similar difficulties. But I think this is going to rise. Again, the generational discrepancies in the working class uh, give me optimism about that. We'll, we'll now move to a question from our audience, comrade. Hi. Um, Lenin wrote about the link between the formation of finance capital and imperialism. So how does uh, finance capital and international banks relate to imperial conquests in the global south? Uh, well, the thing is that all the operations that uh, other kinds of capital do in the, in the, in the south and back there everywhere are financed by bonds, they're financed by loans. This puts the uh, puts finance capital in the dominant position. And uh, this has been going on for a long while, but it became more, uh, more prominent in Lenin's day. And of course it continues today. It's, it's, that's the way things are financed and, and that, that's what puts finance capital in the dominant position. One more question from our live audience. Um, how is the IMF 
reacting and adjusting their activities to China and the Belt Road initiatives as it has become an alternative source of investment for the global South? Uh, with panic. You know, this is a big threat to the games that are played by the IMF. The IMF, by the way, is controlled by the United States substantially. And the United States government is, of course, controlled by our ruling class, which is uh, also an instrumentality of monopoly capital. So there, I haven't seen them making any concessions. I haven't seen them modify their their you know their conditions, their adherence to neoliberal uh, policies. As far as I can see, and I'm not an economist, by the way, as you can probably tell, uh, but uh, they uh, they are doing the same they always did, which is to deny uh, funding help uh, of any kind to those countries that. Uh, buck the system you know if you if you want to look up statistics on cuba any kind of statistics on wikipedia you you find that they give several sources and one is the world bank the other is the imf and the other is guess what the central intelligence agency look up uh, you know public health statistics on cuba and so on and you find that cuba is not listed in the imf and we're World Bank sort of because they don't do business with Cuba. They, they boycott Cuba. And, uh, you know, so oddly enough, where you see those, where you easily ex access those statistics is from CIA sources or, of course, from the Cuban uh, government itself. So, uh, you know, they're not making big concessions. Occasionally, concessions have been made. Occasionally, there's been debt restructuring. But uh, they think they can hold fast, but we know better because we are Marxist Leninists and we understand that these things uh, get eroded by class struggle and by the general crisis of capitalism. Thank you so much, Emil, for your, or Comrade Shepherds, for your participation. We deeply appreciate it. Um, we'll now move on to musical performances and fraternal greetings before the Peace and Solidarity gives their presentation. So up right now will be a musical performance from Primero de Mayo. Hi, my name is Ismael, and I hope you have a wonderful conference of peace and about peace. This is the group Primero de Mayo, which means May 1st, and you all know what that means. And we've been together maybe 35 years, something like that. My name is Adriana Cano. Um, I am the vocalist and part of the percussion. And my name is Rolando Fraga, and I'm recently retired from the electrical industry. Yay! So the song that Adriana is going to do now is Solo Le Pido a Dios, um, which is by Leon Gieco. And the song is titled, uh, in English, I only ask of God that I not be indifferent to suffering, that I not be indifferent to war, that I not be indifferent to the giant that is hunger. Que la vez se 
Thank you to um, for Merida Mayo for that beautiful song. Um, we'll now give the floor to Comrade Claudio De Negri, International Secretary of the Communist Party of Chile. Muy buenos días. Yo soy Claudio De Negri, encargado de relaciones internacionales del Partido Comunista de Chile. Y quiero aprovechar esta ocasión para hacer llegar a todas y todos los militantes heroicos, para nosotros heroicos, del Partido Comunista de los Estados Unidos, porque nosotros que hemos pasado por dictaduras, represiones, clandestinidades, este partido que tiene 110 años de vida, ha vivido muchas situaciones muy duras, sabemos apreciar el valor de quienes luchan en Estados Unidos, que es la capital del imperio. Hemos recibido y hemos podido compartir una, unos días de encuentro, de trabajo muy interesantes con una delegación de ustedes que vino a visitar Chile, que estuvieron en las comunas, con los pobladores, con los jóvenes, con los trabajadores, viviendo el momento que estamos enfrentando nosotros acá en Chile, que es muy importante. Ustedes saben, en los próximos días habrá un plebiscito donde vamos a, esperamos ratificar una nueva constitución política para Chile que deje atrás, en el olvido, la constitución que nos impuso la dictadura de Pinochet. Eh, estamos en un momento en que hay un nuevo gobierno que eh, nosotros hemos apoyado eh, en alianza con otros sectores y que tenemos el propósito de superar las políticas neoliberales en las que Chile ha estado cautivo por décadas desde la dictadura. Eh, son pasos muy profundos y solamente en virtud del tiempo quiero enviarles un abrazo de todos nosotros. Lo que hagan ustedes es para nosotros también sumamente importante. Así no nos sentimos solos y aprendemos también de su experiencia. Ojalá que podamos estrechar más nuestro lazo porque vamos estos desafíos que estamos enfrentando, que son cambios a nivel global, ¿no? a nivel de toda la humanidad, los tendremos que enfrentar juntos. Cada uno de acuerdo a su realidad, a sus costumbres, a sus propias características, pero en esta lucha tenemos que trabajar, asumir todos juntos. Como dice el manifiesto, como dijo Marx y Engels, proletarios del mundo unidos. Y eso hoy día está eh, absolutamente vigente. Un gran abrazo para todas y para todos desde Chile. Gracias, compañero. Thank you, uh, Comrade Negri. We stand in solidarity with all of our comrades in Chile as they continue their struggle. We'll now give the floor to Comrade. Uh, Renate Kopp, International Secretary of the Communist Party of Germany. Dear comrades, I send the greetings of the German Communist Party to your conference. Anti-imperialism, internationalism and anti-militarism belong together. They are one. There's a war going on in Europe at the moment. Not since February 2022, but since 2014, when the Ukrainian regime's war of aggression against the Donbass began after the state coup in Ukraine. A regime that is closely linked to fascist forces and suppresses any opposition inside the country, does not grant any rights to the Russian-speaking population and bans everything related to socialism and the Soviet Union. In 2014, the people in many parts of Ukraine resisted this course. In the Donbass, they were successful and voted overwhelmingly in 2014 in a referendum in favor of independent people's republics. The result was an attack by the Kiev regime that led to large parts of the Donbas republics being occupied and living under an occupation regime for eight years. This war was not the first in Europe since 1945. Even before that, there was NATO's war of aggression against Yugoslavia, in which the German government was also involved. There are currently more than two dozen wars worldwide, from many of which US imperialism and NATO bear responsibility. 
This is also the case with the current war in Ukraine. NATO has been aggressively expanding eastward for several decades. In this context, troops of the Bundeswehr are now on the Russian border in the Baltic states. Ukraine has been turned into a deployment area against Russia. This was another step in the military encirclement of the Russian Federation. The West, including Germany, in a leading position, supported the coup in Ukraine in 2014 in every way, as well as the military attacks against the Donbas and the sabotage of the Minsk agreements. At the same time, all the proposals of the Russian Federation for a peace order and security in Europe were ignored, while at the same time the Ukrainian regime officially announced that it would prospectively deploy nuclear weapons. Russian military intervention is a consequence of this policy of US imperialism and NATO, which threatens Russia's security. Despite all the different views, which also exist in our party, we agree that the military support of the Donbas by Russia is in accordance with the international law and it means for the people in Donbas the hope for an end of the occupation and the content attacks on the part of the Ukrainian regime. At the same time, this military confrontation carries the risks of further escalation, but an end to it is clearly not desired by NATO. NATO is pursuing a military confrontation with Russia in Ukraine at the expense of the Ukra Ukrainian people. For this reason, the Kiev regime is receiving increasing financial and military support. In the EU and also in Germany, this cause is accompanied by dismantling of democratic and social rights. The increasing military expenditures are being passed on to the working people. For us, this means that the anti-militarist and anti-imperialist struggle must take place against the war policy of NATO and the EU. Our party is also committed to this and the peace movement in our country. We demand no increase in the arms budget, disarmament instead of more arms, money for social welfare, education and health, no foreign deployments of the Bundeswehr and no arms exports, Germany out of NATO, an end to all sanctions. An end of war and imperialism we can only achieve together. For peace and socialism, long live international solidarity. Thank you, comrade. We will now give the floor to Miguel Figueroa, member of the Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party of Canada. Hello, everyone. My name is Miguel Figueroa and I'm a member of the Central Executive of the Communist Party of Canada. On behalf of our entire leadership and members across the country, I'm pleased to bring greetings to this very important conference and to its host, the Communist Party USA. As we are all well aware, contradictions within the global capitalist system are maturing rapidly and reaching a critical breaking point. These are not just overlapping crises in the global economy, in the widening of social disparities, in the deterioration of the environment, in the rise of racist, fascist, and anti-equality movements, and in the uh, collapse of credibility of bourgeois governments in the eyes of the people. In our view, these are all interrelated features of a single systemic crisis and decay of capitalism itself. Devoid of any real or constructive solutions to this all-sided crisis, and in conditions of the growing threat to the hegemony of the U.S. empire and its imperialist allies, including Canada, ruling circles are increasingly turning to militarism and war to preserve their domination, regardless of the cost to humanity. This is the underlying basis for the new Cold War fomented by the leading imperialist powers against the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China in the first place, but also against Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Iran, and many other countries and peoples refusing to bow to Washington's dictates and its so-called rules-based international imperialist order. NATO's expansion in Eastern Europe and its use of Ukraine as a staging ground for a proxy war on Russia, and the recent provocative visit of Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan are just the most recent manifestations of this reactionary offensive, one which is bringing humanity ever closer to the edge of nuclear annihilation. To its shame, the government in Ottawa under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau not only lends support to NATO and his new strategic concept, in many instances it's playing a dominant role 
in advancing Washington's aggressive agenda, particularly in Venezuela and Ukraine and in the new Cold War on China. It's worth noting that when the liberals replaced the conservatives in 2015, many on the broader left hoped that Canadian foreign and defense policies would move in a more peaceful, independent direction. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Indeed, Canada's foreign policy has become even more hawkish and confrontational. This dangerous drive of imperialism is a monumental threat, not only to the communist and revolutionary forces, but to all peoples and nations struggling for a peaceful uh, and more socially just and cooperative future. Our movement bears a special responsibility to redouble our efforts to unite and expand anti-imperialist actions and to strengthen the global peace and solidarity movements. This is a massive challenge under the current conditions, requiring both a sharpened battle of ideas and also concrete initiatives. And time is our enemy here. There is no alternative but to act with clarity, unity, and urgency. We wish your deliberations every success, and we stand ready to contribute however we can to our shared aspirations and goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, comrade. We will now give the floor to uh, comrade Santos Arena, General Secretary of the Popular Socialist Party of Mexico. Estimados camaradas, agradecemos la invitación y felicitamos al hermano Partido Comunista de Estados Unidos por su iniciativa de convocar a esta conferencia internacional para intercambiar juicios sobre el tema internacionalismo y antiimperialismo. En opinión de nuestro partido, el Partido Popular Socialista de México, un deber fundamental e insoslayable para los comunistas del mundo es la lucha contra el imperialismo yanqui y sus aliados e incondicionales europeos de la OTAN, distinguiendo claramente el carácter concreto de ese imperialismo que lo diferencia de otros países que siguiendo las leyes del desarrollo develadas por Marx, Engels y Lenin han llegado a la etapa del imperialismo como fenómeno económico pero que carecen de la agresividad y afán de dominio planetario que caracteriza al aquí denunciado. Es decir, según lo aconsejan las leyes de la dialéctica, es indispensable no confundir al imperialismo como categoría económica con la conducta que su clase social dominante asuma en cada situación concreta de nuestra época. Como bien lo anotan ustedes en la invitación, el imperialismo yanqui, OTAN, hace lo que ningún otro imperialismo en el mundo, ataca a Cuba, que es la actual plaza más avanzada de la clase trabajadora en el orbe, sometiéndola a un bloqueo genocida e ilegal y tratando de destruir la firme voluntad del pueblo hermano por ejercer su autodeterminación al optar por edificar el socialismo y agrede también a todos los demás pueblos de América Latina que van instalando gobiernos no neoliberales que inician el camino del desarrollo de sus fuerzas productivas nacionales con independencia de los dictados de Washington y al mismo tiempo se ha empeñado en extender el predominio de la OTAN en Europa del Este en incrementar su injerencia militar en África y en amenazar a China cuyo veloz y continuado desenvolvimiento económico ven como un gravísimo riesgo para un predominio hegemónico mundial, que en vano se empeñan en mantener como si fuera posible detener las leyes objetivas de la realidad que anuncian el fin inminente del mundo unipolar, surgido luego de la caída de la gloriosa Unión Soviética 
y las democracias populares de Europa. Los comunistas del mundo no podemos olvidar que ese, y no otro, el imperialismo estadounidense, con sus socios menores europeos, constituye el enemigo fundamental de todos los pueblos del mundo hoy. Sin otro particular, hacemos votos por el fortalecimiento de los vínculos que históricamente han unido a nuestros dos partidos y por la unidad plena entre todos los partidos comunistas y obreros del mundo. Thank you, Comrade Urbina. Before our Peace and Solidarity Commission uh, begins their presentations, we have a highlight reel of, quip, of clips from two webinars hosted by the CPUSA in the past year on China's poverty alleviation and Vietnam's path to socialism. We hope you enjoy. Hi, everyone. So, um, so my topic is one rural village's experience on poverty alleviation. So you can see that uh, on the left, picture is a uh, very uh, large uh, uh, water and uh, on the right one uh, is the village uh, in, uh, before the uh, poverty elevation the people uh, live in a very old house this picture on the left one is my uh, home my grandparents and my parents and my sister brother and me lived here but on the right picture, you can see that my house and my labor's house uh, is changed a lot. The battle against poverty is a profound revolution and a complete victory on both material and theoretical level. Through this battle, the mindsets of the poor has been enriched and sublimed. They have greater confidence more active minds and higher aspirations. We can learn. We can learn as the richest, the most developed country in the world, I think, uh, from what China is accomplishing, has accomplished and continues to accomplish. Uh, but the key point for us is to develop our own road to socialism with American characteristics and join with China as a friend and ally. We, we can, in the future, we can uh, have more this kind of practice, you know, to share experience um, of what uh, what is do, uh, what has been done in China and what is doing in, in the US and how to cope with poverty um, by each of our uh, different countries. And uh, um, that will promote actually mutual understanding between us and what is the real China, what is the real U.S., uh, what is the real Chinese people, and, and what is the real U.S. people, what, what are we going through? And so I think the sharing of information and experience is very important. This is something I think our party, the Communist Party of the United States of America, does uh, identify with and support our definitions of socialism and the Chinese definitions of socialism bring both of us together. Now it is a new beginning of for a new era. I'd like to thank all the foreign friends, including CPUSA, for supporting us in the fight against poverty. And I wish that we will continue to have your support in the future. from Hanoi, Vietnam. Now in Hanoi is uh, 7 a.m. and I know that you are in the evening. But uh, this time distance and physical distance uh, cannot uh, separate us. And we are together here and I'm very honored. There's a kind of resurgence of kind of homegrown interest in Marxism. So Marxism is taught in universities, sometimes well and sometimes not so well. But there have been like study groups and videos I found online of people 
having their own grassroots discussion among young people. What does this mean? What does it mean in the world? What does it mean for Vietnam? How do we think it should be developed and stuff like that? The party has a uh, has a launch a policy of uh, on the one hand and to reconstruct economy in order to to increase more the uh, more effectiveness of the economy productivity and 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 and, and self sustainability uh, of the economy Vietnam has the probably the world's record for the number of strikes that actually win all are part of the demands most of them are wildcat they don't go through the whole procedure but in general they win because of the support of the public and the local government and party will come in and support them uh, absolute majority of population in vietnam uh, enjoy and appreciate the social economic development of the country even not only people in the cities in the industrial centers but people in uh, rural areas yeah, you know uh, you go to the villages of vietnam today you can see a lot of positive changes and how do they keep the imagination of what socialism will look look like in the future in a world that's overwhelmingly capitalist um, even though vietnam and cuba and some other countries have made tremendous you know strides forward so kind of keeping that as a creative thinking among people is a job that the party talks about. People say that their life today is much better than before. And and they do believe that tomorrow will be better than today. We will now welcome our Peace and Solidarity Commission and its subcommittees to present on the ongoing struggles being waged around the world and the role that we as the Communist Party of the US of the United States can play in these international struggles. Please welcome our first speaker from the Peace and Solidarity Commission, Comrade Henry Lowendorf. <clears throat> Henry Lowendorf has been a peace activist since joining the movement to end the war on Vietnam since the 1960s. He was selected uh, to chair the new, newly revitalized Peace and Solidarity Commission of the party in 2020. He also chairs the Greater New Haven uh, Connecticut Peace Council and is a member of the Executive Board and Secretariat of the U.S. Peace Council. In 2020, he helped coordinate the efforts that led to New Haven voters overwhelmingly passing a ballot referendum calling for our government to move money from the military to our community's human, human needs. He continues working the local peace coalitions throughout the country to promote the national Move the Money campaign that grew out of that referendum. Henry helped found and participated in the Legislative Commission on Connecticut's Future, aimed to examine how to convert uh, Connecticut's war industry to peacetime green manufacturing while ensuring that the workers ret uh, retain decent manufacturing and other jobs aside from making killing machines. In 2016, he led a fact-finding delegation to Syria to break the silence uh, of the peace movement over the U.S. weaponized war on that country. He participates in both the national and international no foreign military basis coalition and conferences to close uh, the more than 800 U.S. foreign military bases that threaten the planet. Comrade Henry Lowendorf, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm I'm really pleased to be part of this important conference. What wonderful presentations we've seen. We've heard a sharp critique of imperialism from, uh, from a widespread group of singers and speakers. It's quite, quite uh, impressive. As you know, we live in an era of extreme danger to humankind and the existence to life on this planet. The two existential threats to humanity, scorching of the planet and nuclear war are not only being poorly confronted, but worse, are being exacerbated by the ruling class, primarily of our country. A lot of the threats to us, to our survival, are being hidden or heavily distorted. In the last 75 years, the United States invaded one country after another, leading to the devastation of those countries and their people, resulting in many dead and seriously wounded young Americans not to mention 
the, the, the targeted peoples, in particular in Korea and Vietnam. Family and friends of the casualties, along with many others, began to take action to oppose these and subsequent wars. Public demonstrations and other political actions threatened to derail the goals of US imperialism, namely the project to totally dominate the world by military, financial, political, and cultural means. Totally dominate the world, or in the words of imperialism itself, full spectrum dominance. To circumvent internal popular resistance to wars for total dominance, the US political leaders are provoking wars that don't directly involve US troops dying on the one hand and imposing economic wars on the other. That is what our country is doing. Two most recent examples of generating shooting wars are one, evolving grave threats to Russia by surrounding it with US and NATO military forces, threats that successfully provoked Russia to invade Ukraine, leading to massive death and destruction, war without sending in US troops. The second example, the US has for a long time encircled China with military bases. <clears throat> it has weaponized human rights against China. It has imposed trade sanctions. The US is building new military alliances against China and recently led multilateral war exercises in the Pacific aimed at threatening China. In the last few weeks, the US has intentionally provoked China by directly assaulting the globally accepted one China policy that recognizes that Taiwan is part of China. These policies are aimed at building a wall around China to restrict its ability to develop its, its society and economy. Attacking the one China is aimed at generating a devastating civil war within China. A major goal of US imperialism is to weaken targeted nations economically or to prevent them from playing a significant role on the world stage. In the case of China, the goal is to prevent it from becoming a wealthy developed socialist society. Selling US made weapons and US owned fossil fuels at great profit is a corollary goal. Constructing vastly profitable imperialistic wars without the backlash generated from US troops dying, accelerated after the US military and political defeat in Vietnam in the 1970s. Such sanitary wars have predecessors in the wars of the 1980s, Iraq-Iran, the Nicaraguan Contra War, the Afghanistan War, and of course, the earlier Bay of Pigs attack on Cuba in 1961. The US takes a second approach to global dominance that our own people largely don't notice. Its form is the deadly sanctions the government applies on countries that insist on finding their own path to the future without US monopoly corporations controlling them. Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, Syria, Iran, Nicaragua, and China are among the nearly 40 countries subject to US such sanctions. In every scenario, the US government and its allies in the corporate media have mobilized massive propaganda and censorship machinery to deceive and numb the public from seeing the war crimes our country is carrying out. The Peace and Solidarity Commission was recreated by the Communist Party USA's 2019 convention to counter this warmongering in all of its forms, to explore, evaluate, and educate around peace issues, and to energize members of the party and the broader public into taking collective action. As you will hear, the commission initiates statements, articles, and webinars and we collaborate closely with our international department. During the pandemic, the Peace and Solidarity Commission evolved subcommittees focused on different geographical regions, Asia, Africa, the Americas, the Middle East, to focus and make our work more effective. Following my presentation, you will hear some results of the work of these subcommittees. Beyond education, the second part, and most important work of the Peace and Solidarity Commission 
consists in helping the party build the broadest possible peace movement in our country. We recognize the important meaning of the phrase, all politics is local. Collective local activity is essential for the growth of the national peace movement. Party members are urged to join or create local peace organizations and coalitions to demand peace and social justice that our increasingly militarized society fails to address. For example, broad coalitions around the country have been developed to cut the huge trillion dollar a year military budget that now smothers the civilian economy by vacuum, vacuuming up vast resources. These coalitions have succeeded in mobilizing city councils to pass resolutions demanding Congress move money away from the war budget and redirect it into a just transition to jobs with living wages, producing sustainable energy, ensuring housing, healthcare, education, food security, and so on. Such coalitions have succeeded in a number of smaller cities throughout the country and are now working in major cities, including New York, Pittsburgh, and Denver. Members of our party are encouraged to work in such move the money coalitions. Members are also urged to join solidarity coalitions that generate actions with the people of nations hounded by toxic US policies. One example of local solidarity organizing just took place this weekend in Connecticut, where I live. In the last two years, in response to recommendations of the National Network on Cuba, resolutions were passed by the city councils of Hartford, the capital, and New Haven, calling on our federal government to end the 60 year old illegal blockade of Cuba. They joined some 40 such resolutions in legislative and other bodies across the nation. Based on Connecticut's resolutions, a statewide coalition formed to bring the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations to visit Connecticut. His visit, just concluded, is already stimulating further actions to pressure our government to normalize relations with our neighbor to the South. To, a build, to build a successful peace and solidarity movement in the U.S. requires working with and mobilizing the rainbow array of people and organizations in our communities. As is evident, we've come a long way and is, is also evident we still have a very long way to go. Through both education and action, we build the peace movement and we build the party. I now have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Duncan McFarland, the chair of the Asia Pacific Subcommittee of our Peace and Solidarity Commission. He's been an anti-war and peace activist since the 1960s, which started his interest in Vietnam and China. Duncan was active with United for Justice with Peace, the Boston area affiliate of the national United for Peace and Justice, which organized major national protest demonstrations opposing the war and occupation of Iraq during 2002 to 2007. He works with the Boston Chinatown on friendship with, sorry, with Boston Chinatown on friendship projects and edited what is really an excellent book entitled A China Reader, published last year in 2021 by Changemaker Press. Duncan, the camera is yours. Thank you, Henry, for your kind introduction. The Asia, Asia Pacific Subcommittee formed about one and a half years ago when some members of the Peace and Solidarity Commission formed the China Subcommittee for both education and action. Since then, our work has expanded to include Vietnam, Australia, and Laos. The global economic and strategic significance of the Asia Pacific region will only grow in coming years as containing China is now explicitly the long-term number one goal of US imperialism. 
these are critical issues in our times. We must oppose a new Cold War and oppose increasing racism at home against Asians, Chinese, and other people of color. The subcommittee organized successful webinars on poverty alleviation in China and Vietnam's path to socialism with speakers from both those countries. And a clip of those was just shown. We presented on a panel organized by the CP Australia opposing the AUKUS military agreement. Our meetings got firsthand reports from Beijing, Hanoi, and Vientiane, and updates on work visas and student exchanges. We have participated in Zoom webinars on Marxist topics hosted by the International Department of the Communist Party of China. Meetings were devoted to discussion of the CPC Sixth Plenary 100 Years History Document and Vietnam General Secretary Trong's important speech on the achievements and challenges of socialism in Vietnam. We invite people to join us in our activities. Specifically, we'll be hosting a discussion of China's 20th Party Congress upon its conclusion later this fall. This is a very important meeting for understanding Chinese politics. We are also scheduling a webinar on Vietnam's foreign policy and international relations. And uh, so we encourage people to go to Red World Review slash sign up and sign up for these events. Again, we call on conference participants to join in peace and solidarity work and oppose imperialism and help strengthen the US peace movement. And now I'd like to introduce three members of the Asia Pacific subcommittee who can talk about our work. And first, I'd like to introduce Emily from Beijing. Emily is a member of the Virginia District and Asia Pacific subcommittee. Currently, she is working on a postdoc in Beijing. Her talk is entitled, a Chinese American Comrade's Journey to CPUSA and International Solidarity. Emily. Hi, comrades. I'm a second generation Chinese American. I spent much of my childhood in China, experiencing firsthand one of the most successful socialist projects which many of our comrades has covered and I'll not repeat for the sake of time. Instead, I'll be sharing a personal story. After I came back to the US, I find myself struggling a lot with the reconciliation between the society and the many aspects of my identity as a Chinese American, a queer woman and so on. And for many years, the two aspects that were usually overlooked or silenced sometimes by myself were my identity as a Chinese and a communist for fear of rejection and enmity. It was in 2020 amidst the height of Sinophobia that I discovered CPUSA. I saw that the party stood firmly against racism and hatred that, and that it not only supports but also learns from socialist countries of today such as the Chinese experience. I realized that this is the leftist space where my beliefs and my identity are no longer liabilities but are valued and have purposes. So that's why I'm here. Right now, I'm working in Beijing, reconnecting with my heritage and providing fresh looks of China's progress on the ground with my advantage in the language and culture. Comrades, we're now at a critical point of history with the new Cold War and danger of actual war. Our ruling class is making desperate moves on the Taiwan Strait in order to preserve their profit. They've tried their hands on Tibet, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang and failed. And now they are willing to pull us into more calamities and risk the lives of the people, especially people of color, as anti-Asian violence has increased for several fold in recent years. There's so much indoctrination and ignorance that we need to overcome and we must use every ounce of our working class experience and knowledge to combat the ruling class's schemes and lies. So to all of my comrades, especially comrades of color, you have a voice in the CPUSA. Your experience and knowledge are invaluable. The world, the working people of the world needs you more than ever. So join the peace movement and we move, look forward to meet you in this struggle. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Emily. And now I would like to introduce Amiad from Hanoi. Amiad is a member of the International Department and chair of its publication subcommittee. He has lived in Hanoi for nearly 10 years. He regularly reports on Vietnam for the people's world and is active in Vietnam solidarity work. He will speak on the comradely history between Communist Party USA and the Communist Party of Vietnam. Amiad. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, the fraternal and comradely history of the relationship between the Communist Party USA and the Communist Party of Vietnam is a long and storied one. From Vietnam's early fight for independence through the horrific days of the American imperialist war in Vietnam through to today, CPUSA has always stood side by side with our comrades in Vietnam, putting our internationalist ideals into action. During the war in the US, the party helped organize anti-war protests and organize the youth against the war through party-led W.E.B. Du Bois clubs. CPUSA also tried to rally support around people who refused to be drafted, such as with the Fort, Fort Hood Three. On the international front, CPUSA General Secretary Gus Hall, CPUSA Vice Presidential Candidate Jarvis Tyner, and other party leaders went to North Vietnam in support of the anti-war movement in an act of solidarity with our Vietnamese comrades. They returned to the US and made sure the American public was aware of the horrific crimes being committed against the Vietnamese people in the name of imperialism that they had witnessed firsthand. After the war, during the long imperialist embargo of Vietnam, CPUSA were among the loudest proponents of lifting the inhumane blockade. Today, the Asia Pacific Subcommittee of the Peace and Solidarity Commission continues to foster the long relationship between, the long relationship between our two parties. Through educational webinars, publishing articles, we work to help Americans learn the truth about the life in Vietnam, Vietnam's successes on the roads to building socialism, and to see through the neo-McCarthyist, anti-communist lies spread in the West. I know that for myself, and I'm confident the same is true, same is true for all the members of our subcommittee. I am extremely proud to be able to continue the long tradition of internationalism and, and anti-imperialism shared by the CPUSA and the Communist Party of Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amiad. And now I'd like to introduce another member of our subcommittee, Callum. Callum is a, a member of the District Committee of the Communist Party of Eastern Pennsylvania and Delaware, and is active in the No More War Peace Coalition in Philadelphia. Callum has recently been accepted into East China Normal University in Shanghai to study for a master's degree in political theory. Callum will talk about the importance of internationalism to young Americans. Callum. Yeah, so I mean, internationalism, I would say, is extremely important to young Americans, even if most are unaware of it, simply because for as long as people of my generation have really been alive on this earth, our country has been at war or off on some military adventure, um, you know, since we've been, been alive. And um, that is directly related to our struggles here, you know, when we are struggling to get student debt relief or, you know, for education or healthcare, you know, we're told that, you know, these, the, the funds for these uh, initiatives simply do not exist. At the same time, while we've been alive, you know, there's been horrendous military adventures across the earth. And of course, that's where all the money is really going. And secondly, really, is that young Americans today cannot count on the same standard of living that the union way of life provided uh, for our parents. I mean, I'm sure many young people here have heard that, you know, some, you know, adult or, you know, uh, telling them when they were younger that, you know, when I was your age, I had this, that, and that, and I can do this, that, and that. Well, that simply does not exist uh, for our generation anymore. Um, we are burdened with debt. Uh, and we have a, a lot of struggles ahead of us. Uh, and so it's really no wonder that uh, this generation has probably the most favorable opinion of socialism, at least ever recorded. Um, 
and probably the you know biggest you know reason why Americans you know are growing more favorable of socialism and why having a more favorable interest in internationalism is that you know we're poised to inherit a planet whose future is very uncertain. Um, you know, climate change and the degradation of the environment, you know, it's not, you know, it's for real. And despite what a lot of you know, Republican pundits are saying, it, it threatens you know, life on this planet. And so working hand in hand together with other young people and environmental activists and comrades from across the world um, is important, you know, for the survival of our generation and the survival of the planet. And and also in, in in regards to the work of the subcommittee, I feel it's 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 been extremely rewarding um, because at least for me, it's you know give, give me the drive to pursue uh, an education abroad, uh, something that I probably would not have considered um, if I had not seriously become more engaged uh, in internationalism. You know, for example, like working on that uh, webinar on poverty alleviation was one of the you know it was a very proud moment of my life and kind of gave gave me the drive to you know believe I can do this. And that's the same, you know, for everyone else in the subcommittee. Uh, nearly everyone, you know, is seeking edu education abroad or working abroad, you know, putting, uh, you know, internationalist, you know, principles into practice. So, yeah, that's it for me. I just want to say uh, uh, thank you again, uh, Duncan, for the introduction, and thank you for the comrade for uh, both at home and abroad for uh, making this uh, uh, possible. Thank you, comrades, for your presentations. Uh, remember, Q and A. Uh, send your questions in uh, through this presentation. We'll answer them after the end of the Peace and Solidarity Commission's presentations have concluded. Our next presentations uh, will be by the America Subcommittee. Um, before we continue, it's the perfect time to mention that we are now about hundred dollars away from reaching our two thousand dollar fundraising goal for Cuban Solidarity to send medical equipment to the National Network on Cuba's Saving Lives campaign. Log on to redworldreview.org slash sign up to donate and help us reach our goal before the conclusion of this conference today. Next up is the America Subcommittee with a presentation by Andres on socialists and social democratic governments challenging US hegemony in the Americas. Andres Jimenez Montoya is a co-facilitator of the CPUSA Peace and Solidarity Commission's America Subcommittee, co-chair of the Ethnic Diversity Committee for the California Federation of Teachers, co-coordinator of the International Association of Mexican and Greater Mexico Studies, and a member of the editorial committee of uh, the Revista de la Universidad de la Habana in Havana, Cuba. Jimenez also serves as president and CEO of Americas, an international solidarity action nonprofit organization. Jimenez participated in the 11th contingent of the Cuban solidarity organization, um, Venezuelos Brigade in 1978. He has worked as a journalist, community organizer, socialist activist, uh, active advocate and a local appointed official in the San Francisco East Bay region. Comrade, you have the floor. Thank you so very much. Uh, I am reporting to you today from Mexico City. I'm in the middle of some meetings, some of which are related exactly to international solidarity, including with our uh, other comrades here in Mexico City from the Cuban embassy. Um, we face the the subcommittee on the Americas was just created in the last year. We're getting off the ground in terms of doing a number of activities, but we don't want to get in the way of existing successful efforts. And we've built quite a few in the United States of solidarity with countries and movements and the peoples of the Americas. Of course, the, the work, the National Network on Cuba is doing very important work right now, particularly in the area of, 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 of uh, supporting uh, the, uh, the, um, the fundraising to be able to deliver important medical equipment as well as provide other uh, necessities for life given the the, the the stranglehold of the U.S. economic during the Trump administration. What I want to do is name because and where we plan to go is an America's committee and invite the participation of all of those who are present today at this very important first meeting, first international conference. 
you know, we do face a new set of strategic, economic, and political conditions in the Americas. In fact, this section, we, we, we titled The Rise of Socialism, that that present developed a strategy for international solidarity and anti-imperialism. The first is to take a look at the fact that the, the political realities are changing in the Americas. Uh, we, the, um, the, because, of the, because of mass movements in countries like Chile and in Colombia, uh, Peru and Bolivia, uh, and throughout the region, uh, we, we've seen the rise of governments representing uh, low working class people, low and moderate income people, trying to achieve a, a, a better life and a better life by having activist governments that play a role on behalf of the working class, working with the labor movement and with peasant movements and with indigenous peoples throughout the Americas. Um, I think we can follow the lead of those governments in challenging uh, U.S. Uh, attempts to put a break on reforms, the radical reforms in the Americas. Uh, I think we can also uh, build on the longstanding solidarity groups a long-standing work of solidarity groups in the United States that have been working with a number of these popular movements in, in the Americas for, for over, over half a century. Um, and I think, uh, as I will get into a bit, in a bit, the, these governments and, and the popular organizations supporting them are helping to point the way of our own understanding of where we can limit and where we can prevent further intervention by the United States and the self-determination of the Americas. Um, and finally, I think we also need to understand that the working class in the United States is, is composed of an ever larger number of peoples from uh, south of the Rio Grande or, or the Caribbean. Uh, because, of, in fact, as we see our own working class, we can see a, a working class that's much more from Latin America and the Caribbean. And that works hand in glove with the solidarity work because our own labor organizations, our own uh, popular organizations, our own solidarity organizations, include the participation of people whose ancestry is in the very countries of all of the Americas, and particularly uh, in Mexico, given the large number, uh, over 45 million people of Mexican origin in the United States, with another 20 million from other countries. Um, I, I wanna return to some of the points that I just introduced. One is we're seeing a rise in return of socialist and social democratic governments in the Americas, in addition to Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Uh, and we also are seeing the leadership of countries like Mexico, which, it, which had a change in government and a change in regime really with the 2018 election that in which 53% of Mexican voters voted for the current president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. We could, Mexico has been, uh, has assumed recently the leadership of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, CELAC, and as part of that work and as part of it, its international uh, diplomatic efforts, Mexico is actually proposing the, the dismantling of the organization of American states and the creation of another uh, entity that would be something more like a, a, an America's union based loosely on the, on the European Union. But the real important piece of that is that Mexico believes that U.S. hegemony is no longer fits the current realities uh, in the Americas. And specifically, the Mexican president has argued for the importance of ending the blockade, economic blockade of Cuba, and including Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, in all international meetings of the Americas. And, and, and for that reason, the president of Mexico did not attend uh, the, the, the recent uh, conference of the Americas uh, in Los Angeles because of the fact that Cuba and Venezuela were not included, nor Nicaragua, uh, as, part of, as part of that meeting. But we can also see, aside from Mexico, the emergence of, of center of, of social democratic and socialist governments in Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Honduras, Chile, recently Colombia. And it looks very much that uh, in Brazil, there will be a return of President Lula to the presidency. And we should also not forget, as we consider a, the, the, the situation of the Americas, the ongoing colonial crisis of Puerto Rico 
and the importance of Puerto Rico for the United States and the importance of popular movements in Puerto Rico in response to current challenges and the corruption of many of the vested interests in Puerto Rico aligned with US uh, imperialism. Um, and a, a final point in terms of the, the circumstances of the Americas, we see that beginning with the Trump administration in particular, a particular hardening uh, 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 of the economic blockade against Cuba, as well as similar sanctions pressed against Venezuela and Nicaragua as well. And we find that the solidarity groups in the United States have played significant roles in maintaining ongoing support for the popular movements and socialist movements of the Americas. So finally, let me just say uh, that we, we, we're, we're taking up a challenge of solidarity work in a changed environment that's beginning to limit US power in the Americas. And we need to ally ourselves with these progressive and self-determination movements in the Americas as a way of challenging imperialism and creating the kind of, of social justice and equity that we seek throughout the Americas. And finally, we see a new and added ag aggressivity against solidarity movements in the United States and particularly recently uh, when it comes to solidarity with Cuba, with the FBI investigation of Puentes de Amor and with solidarity groups in Puerto Rico, solidarity groups with Cuba and Puerto Rico. We need to be vigilant and we need to work together. And uh, we are confident that with the allies and the uh, anti-imperialist movement, we will be able to achieve uh, a full solidarity with the popular movements of Latin America. Thank you very much. Well, Andres, we appreciate your presentation, uh, and we also are happy to inform you that we have hit our $2,000 goal for Cuban solidarity. <laughs> Thank you to comrades uh, all around the world that have helped contribute to that. Any excess donations will also still go to the NNOC. Next up is the Middle East Subcommittee with the presentation given by Lucy on a recent delegation to Palestine. First, we'll play a cultural video submitted by Comrade Lucy herself. I want to thank uh, Dylan for inviting me to present this song, uh, which was written by my friend Matt Jones of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Freedom Singers. Uh, he wrote it after uh, he was in the Freedom Singers, but that is his legacy. The song is entitled Palestine, and um, I would appreciate you listening to it. Thank you. If you think of the Middle East in this modern time, you can't help but say the word Palestine, people there have lost their land, some have lost their home, they live in other countries, their freedom almost gone, Palestine needs her freedom, Palestine needs our love, Palestine needs her freedom Palestine needs our love there seems to be no answer to give us the reason why people cannot live so no one has to die we gotta take a stand for freedom take a stand for truth Take a stand for justice, that's what we've got to do. Cause Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine. Freedom 
fighting for their land, fighting for their children. Let's help them take a stand. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. Palestine. A new beginning. Let us plant the seed. Plant the seed of love. Let that love seed grow. Plant the seed for everyone, so all the world will know that Palestine needs her freedom. participation comrade Lucy the floor is now yours uh, Dylan I want to thank you for that wonderful slideshow which accompanied the the song um, one cannot speak of Palestine and overlook Gaza I was not able to visit Gaza on my recent trip in June and July however the recent attacks on Gaza following Joe Biden's visit to Israel have been shown to everyone in the world. In the US media, Palestinian Arabs are called terrorists and Israeli Jews are the beleaguered allies of the US. However, the Israeli violence against preschool children and their mothers cannot be characterized as a battle the way National Public Radio has done. It is a massacre. I ask you to write to NPR and other news outlets to correct their descriptions of what is being done to the Palestinians with the military aid from the U.S. government to the state of Israel. I also ask you to write to three people, your favorite state rep, your favorite U.S. congressperson, and your favorite U.S. senator to oppose the legislation which criminalizes any criticism of the state of Israel and legislation which blocks the transmission of resources to humanitarian organizations which provide educational and health services to Palestinians. On shared screen, I direct your attention to Palestine Legal while I share my reflections on a recent trip. Uh, and to those who have been falsely accused of anti-Semitism, take a look at the book, Reclaiming, Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism, edited by Professor Carolyn Carche. The book is a collection of short biographies of Jewish people from many walks of life who have come to see the Palestinians as human beings. Although I have known the Palestinian story of massacre, dislocation, and invisibilization for many years, there is nothing like travel to a place and seeing the place with my own eyes and meeting the people there who have survived. In the 60s, I attended high school with Zionists who taught me about the land without a people for the people without a land and other lies. 
It was not until after I graduated high school and then met college students in the 70s from other countries like South Africa, Iran, and Algeria that I learned the truth about Palestine. There is value in reading and listening to people tell their stories, but there is nothing like seeing with my own eyes. Traveling to the country and seeing for myself made certain things stand out in my mind. What stood out on my recent visit was the rootedness of this people, their long-standing connection to the land, connection to family, connection to neighbors, this is something that has been destroyed in the United States. In the territory which became the United States, the people who understood the connection to the land and the connection to each other were condemned as savages and massacred. To these indigenous people, the idea of buying and selling land was unconscionable. But so-called Christians from Europe changed all of that. The land was transformed from earth mother to commodity, and money was valued more than people. In the society which they have created on the land that they seized, elders are abandoned until they die, and then their descendants are pitted against each other as they grasp pieces of a crumbling ancestral inheritance. Neighbors are pitted against each other in a contest for prestige. The lies that justify the capitalist system have been told so often that we believe them. We live our lives in obedience to the lies, paying rents and mortgages to the system which stole the land. In Palestine, the connections are still recognized and felt by the Palestinians. Their connections are more real than the lies and the abuses of the Israeli government. In high school, I hung out with students whose father raised money to plant invasive species trees in Palestine. I was told that those trees were planted to make the desert bloom. When I visited Palestine, I learned that those trees were used to cover the land where more than 400 Palestinian villages once stood. Those villages have been massacred the survivors driven into exile and their homes destroyed. The olive trees which the Palestinians had planted centuries ago were uprooted. Trees familiar to the invaders were planted. The Zionists say that they came to a desert and made it bloom. But olives do not grow in the desert. The scientific evidence that olives have been cultivated in, Palestine, in Palestine for millennia counters the lie of a land without people and the lie about it being a desert. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we continue to allow our U.S. tax dollars to support the criminal activity of the Israeli government, the effects of those crimes will visit us. Some of us who are black are already suffering from the same abuses dislocation and invisibilization. I thank you for your attention. Lucy, thank you again so much for your presentation and your performance. Your contributions are very much appreciated. Our next subcommittee um, will be a presentation from the Africa subcommittee with a presentation by uh, Karamo Solomon. Uh, Solomon joined the CPUSA in December 1989 during the uh, Henry Winston campaign. He was in interviewed by the L.C. Dick uh, Dickinson chair of the CPEPA in Delaware District and Beth Elderman, who served as district committee person until her recent death. Lou Incognito noticed him as potential Communist Party leader and helped him abroad the district committee. Up until then, he had served as the club treasurer of the Northeast Club, Recently, the district elected him to chair of the Communist Party of Eastern Pennsylvania and Delaware. He has written several articles for the People's World, and he is currently serving as acting chair of the African Subcommittee of the Peace and Solidarity Commission of the CPUSA, substituting for Gary Hicks, who is ill. Comrade, you have the floor.
Thank you, comrades. Africa is in the serious throes of economic exploitation because of imperialism, neocolonialism, wars, and poverty. Capitalist exploitation and expansion is the reason for Africa's maladies. From the Sahel region down to the Cape of Good Hope, Africa's resources are literally being stolen. In Niger, Mali, Nigeria, oil, uranium, and gold are being taken. Rich mineral deposits of diamond are being removed from the soil, and not one drop of the profits are in the hands of the African peoples. In the Sudan, the struggle is over the border between the North and the South. In Ghana, complaints about U.S. military bases being allowed in the country. In Kenya, cries of election fraud are raised by Mr. Odinga against Mr. Ruto, who up until the time of the election was trailing in the polls. In Tigray, a war rages between forces in Tigray and Ethiopia and Eritrea. A war with massive rapes, killings, and genocidal attacks by both sides. One woman reporter was distraught by not only the sexual assaults and murders, but by the oppression, seizure of documents, and raids upon her office. In South Africa, the former president, Jacob Zuma, is being tried for corruption and bribery. In South Africa, the ANC is facing a difficult challenge in the election because of the charges of corruption. However, these challenges have been a result of the ongoing racist attacks by the Democratic Alliance on the Tripartite Alliance. This has resulted in a movement for secession from South Africa of the Cape region. This is a fragmentation movement sought by the ultra-right capitalists in one of the nation's richest areas. The cruelty and racism of the capitalists and the desire for a neo-apartheid movement is a sad tragedy of capitalist exploitation and imperialism. They hope to maintain a separation of the races, not by segregation laws within the nation, but by the separation of two nations, one predominantly white and rich, the other black and poor. This is not a dream of freedom, but a nightmare of oppression. Niger, though rich in history, is one of the poorest nations in the world. The incomes in Niger are low. The GDP of Niger is 13.69 billion. The per capita income for 2022 is $565 in the United States. The average salary in Niger is 414 United States dollars. 40% of the GDP of Niger is derived from agriculture. Niger, according to Wikipedia, has consistently been ranked at the bottom of the Human Development Index at 0.394 as of 2019. It ranks among the least developed and the most heavily indebted nations in the world. According to the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have a significant impact on Niger households, almost all of which have suffered from the economic slowdown. It is important for the government to be able to reallocate resources from general administration to social services and infrastructure in order to maximize growth opportunities and social welfare. However, despite the poor income, Niger is one of the largest producers of uranium in the world. France began mining of uranium in Niger in the 1970s to take advantage of the rich deposits and the potential of enormous profits. Today, it is the nation's largest export. While the French-owned uranium mining company has become rich and profitable, the country's economy has been stripped and looted because the nation's richest resources has been taken for little or no cost. Niger is also an oil producing nation. In the Tatuma oil field in Mandama, oil was discovered during its independence era. Exxon and Texaco found oil in 1980 in the Agadem Basin. Food insecurity and unemployment remain a severe problem in Nigeria 
And this problem coupled with extreme poverty has been even more aggravated by security issues that have increased because of Al Qaeda and other rebel and reactionary groups who have driven thousands of refugees from Nigeria and other neighboring countries in the Sahel region. This is a small problem compared to the growing problem of pollution and ecological damage that has been brought on by the uranium mining industry. According to Greenpeace, an environmental activist organization, the soil surrounding the mining area has not only become polluted with toxic chemicals, but with radioactive materials. These radioactive materials threaten the life and health of the surrounding community. In the drinking water and the soil, Greenpeace activists found levels of radon that far exceeded the recommended levels prescribed by the World Health Organization. In November 2020, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, sends troops in the southern Tigray in response to an attack on an Ethiopian military base. The attacks on Ethiopian forces were a result of the postponement of the scheduled parliamentary elections because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Etria, in alliance with Ethiopia, would begin its assault from the north. During the first phase of the war, the capital of Tigray was captured by the Allied forces of Etra and Ethiopia. During the struggle, the capital was recaptured and a long and very violent struggle began between the two forces. During this struggle, Tigray's People's Liberation Front joined forces of the Moro Liberation Army. Together, they threatened to march on to Addis Ababa and overthrow the prime minister and his government. The war escalated, and during the war, many atrocities occurred. Both sides practiced a form of war rape. Soldiers would publicly rape women whose ages would range from 8 to 72 years of age. These rapes would often occur in front of their families. Because of the ensuing violence, food, water, and electricity were cut off, causing maltreatment of the children, disease, and death. After the Middle Passage, the world has accepted this as normal. Racism is often acceptable because of slavery. We owe it to ourselves to say we are owed more. We are human. Black or white an atrocity is an atrocity. In addition, we need to stand up and beg that the forces doing the fighting have to understand who they are and what their names mean. To Gray Liberation People's Front means it is the Liberation People's Front. A moral liberation army means it is an army for the liberation of humanity. The Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, the liberation group that once comprised all these forces, means revolutionary democratic not just for Tigray, Ethiopia, Etria, but liberation for the entire people of Africa and the entire world. This is what Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Nelson Mandela, Kwame Nkrumah, Seko Ture, and W.E.B. Du Bois would have understood. This is what I believe they, if they were still alive, would have demanded. Thank you, comrades. Thank you to all the comrades from the Peace and Solidarity Commission for your presentations. We'll now be open the floor to questions and discussion uh, from the audience. We will try to get uh, at least one question per committee. The first question we're gonna take is from our Zoom Q&A, and this is to Amiad or Duncan. Uh, this audience member wants to know, could you please talk about the struggle of the, Vietnam, of the Vietnamese people for justice for Agent Orange victims? Uh, yeah, I can uh, uh, speak to that. Um, so for those that are aware, um, Agent Orange uh, was a uh, defoliant. Basically, it was a uh, it was basically a chemical weapon for, uh, that was marketed as something else that uh, the U.S. used during the war, and uh, it has uh, stayed in the 
bloodlines and in the soil of people and it now has affected three generations uh, of people with horrible side effects of deformities and diseases and illnesses, uh, cancer. Um, the U.S. over the years has pledged to help. And while they the U.S. has helped with the environmental cleanup, they have never helped any of the victims. And worse yet, the companies like uh, Monsanto and Dow Chemical that made these chemicals are protected by the U.S. courts and have never been held accountable. Um, just a couple of weeks ago marked the 61st anniversary of when Agent Orange was first dropped on Vietnam. Um, there are lots of programs here in Vietnam where uh, the main one being a Vietnam, Vietnamese Association of Victims of Agent Orange that uh, builds homes and takes care of the victims and uh, gives care to the victims of now three generations uh, forward. Um, there's also a lot of Americans uh, that handled the chemicals during the war that are also victims and have also, uh, while received some compensation, not much. So it's an ongoing struggle uh, that needs uh, attention. Um, you know, every year, um, Barbara Lee of uh, California tries to uh, submit legislation to get a, the American government to take responsibility for this history. Um, but every year it fails and more and more people need to be aware and more people need to rally around this important cause. Thank you so much, Amiad. The next question we have is for Andres. Um, this question is, can you expand on the way Mexico's Morena movement built towards electoral success? Okay. Yes, I think I got it going again, right? Uh, I'm having a little bit of a connection problem. But um, in fact, Morena represents uh, the evolution of the left in Mexico from the point of the 1988 election, uh, where the, the, the figurehead of the left was Guatemala Cardenas, who, uh, had, who was the son of a famous populist president of the 30s in Mexico. And uh, there was an electoral coalition that developed within uh, what was then the, the center left party, the, the, the party of the democratic revolution that involved community organizers and uh, unions and, and others uh, and led to the uh, successful uh, campaigns of Guatemala Cardenas to be mayor of Mexico City followed by uh, AMLO, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the current president and then follow who then was followed by um, Marcelo Ebrard, uh, who uh, was also uh, mayor of Mexico City and is now the foreign minister and now an active part of Morena. So there, there had been a political evolution where you had the a number of elected officials from the center left party, uh, a number of community groups uh, coalescing around uh, the demand that politics of usual end. And the first campaign, um, well, the first campaign Morena ran for the presidency was in 2018 when Andres Manuel uh, Lopez Obrador for the third time ran for president. And that president, presidential campaign served as a galvanizing force for those who are part of the uh, electoral coalition in Morena. Uh, and it's still a, a coalition in formation, uh, but it looks, they, the Morena now has the governorships of more than half of, of, of Mexico's states and federal entities, so about 17 of them now, of the 31 entities in Mexico with the possibility that today, uh, this year, they'll pick up another two. Uh, but there's an evolving social movement behind uh, building Morena as a party, and it's still very much in the early stages. And like with many countries, uh, the, the definition of the left in Mexico is a little bit more fluid and flexible. And, there's not, uh, while there are traditional parties of the left, there seems to be a consensus in developing a popular movement around uh, issues that are normally supported by democratic socialists and socialist democrats. Uh, I think that the next presidential election looks very good that Morena will again win the presidency. And I've neglected to mention that they have a, a voting majority in both houses of the Mexican Congress. 
So um, I think Me- Mexico's government is going to play an increasingly important role as an ally to other countries of the Americas that are fighting inter- U.S. intervention in the internal affairs of Latin American countries and uh, arguing for a unity of all Latin American governments, including, not excluding anyone, and clearly including Cuba, uh, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. The next question is for Lucy. Uh, Lucy, what allies in the region do the liberation fighters of Palestine have? Um, wow. That's a, an excellent question for which I do not have an answer. Uh, so if the person would like to um, uh, send the question to you, I will research the answer. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, we'll move to Karamo, the African subcommittee. Uh, what is the progress of the resistance to French imperialism in Niger and Mali? I think um, the real thing that they found, and this is the real tragedy of it, is that there has been um, a complaint about French, the French government, um, that they have been in fact um, assisting much to um, assisting and actually uh, doing things in, in benefit for the terrorists. Um, I guess this is a product of, of the imperialists' way of gaining control of the organization and using the violence that is, of course, in terrorizing the people uh, to continue to ensure that their pockets remain full. Uh, it also gives the French military and NATO uh, an added advantage um, to their to those countries' disadvantage, uh, and the bases become uh, instead of ways of protecting people, they become a uh, basis for not only just neo-colonialism, but a, a base uh, for imperialism and an oppression. What can be done in response to this? Uh, there have been a popular upcry, a popular outcry uh, for the discontinuation of bases and the building of bases in the Uni- of the United States, military bases of, that have been built uh, for the US and for French. Uh, the, dis- the discontinuation of NATO assistance and presence in Africa and the strengthening of OAU and the countries of the region uh, so that they can provide, adequately provide for their own defense and uh, also the breaking away uh, for, of, of imperialism, control of their own region's um, um, resources. And once they can get the capital from that and the strengthening of their own um, military forces, I think that that's more than, that will more than adequately assist them in uh, getting rid of the region's terrorism. Thank you. All right, and that will conclude our Q&A session. Um, Before we conclude this historic weekend, we would once again like to encourage everyone to go to redworldreview.org slash sign up to receive information about uh, about work being done by our party's international department in the peace and anti-imperialist movement. Um, Thank you again to Peace and Solidarity for all your contributions. Uh, We certainly appreciate it. Now we have a final speech by the CPUSA International Secretary, Alvaro, to give an overview of what we have discussed and to give some closing remarks. Thank you, comrades. Comrades and friends, the International Department and the Peace and Solidarity Commission of the Communist Party USA thanks you for your participation and uh, in solidarity uh, this weekend. Uh, your contributions to internationalism and uh, anti imperialism are welcome. During the course of this international conference, our speakers, fraternal parties, media activists have remarked on the changing characteristics of imperialism. We have identified U.S. imperialism as the fundamental enemy of the working peoples of the world. 
It is a fundamental principle of the world that the only constant is constant change. It is our responsibility as communists in the imperial core to be quick on our feet, to rise and meet the challenges as they present themselves now, to apply the science of Marxism-Leninism to the fight against imperialism in the 21st century. There is an old curse that states that may you live in interesting times. We are living in a historic turning point, the beginning of the end of U.S. imperialism the beginning of a new multilateral world. In this new world, no nations are contained or isolated like Cuba. Every nation has a seat at the decision-making table. In this new world, independent countries are not made victims of unilateral sanctions, nor forced to implement policies that hurt working people. In this new world, every country can choose their own development path. In, their, in this new world, every nation has a right to security and development. We work for the end of labor exploitation, a world without classes or coercion, a world with peaceful and sustainable well-being and common prosperity. We are in a major struggle for global collaboration to combat common challenges such as nuclear war, pandemics, and global poverty. We are here to help avoid hot wars, economic wars, Cold Wars, and achieve social and economic justice. Our Communist Party program recognizes that the U.S. is the main imperialist power in the world and is therefore the main threat to world peace. The Communist Party and progressive forces in the U.S. have a responsibility to our own working class and to the peoples of the world to build the broadest, strongest peace movement opposed to U.S. imperialist aggression, in, not only here but in, in the world. We say no to global gender inequality, no to racism, no to hegemony. Our demands include the elimination of NATO and the closing of the hundreds of U.S. military bases spread across the globe. The biggest contribution the U.S. working class can make to anti-imperialism is to win our struggle against the warmongering extreme right here at home. The World Communist Movement can bring about the future we desire. Communists are leaders in building socialism. We welcome you to join our ranks. Imperialism is in decline, but it will not exit history without a push. We can, we're counting on you to help push. Our world needs your help. We need your help to build the international communist movement. We are a worldwide movement of over 100 million members in 118 political parties and associated labor, women's, youth, peace, and anti-imperialist forces, but more are needed. We need your help to increase international solidarity. We need your help to strengthen the peace movement in this country. We need your help in the anti-imperialist movement. We thank all of you for your attending the Communist Party USA's first international conference on internationalism and anti-imperialism. We are very proud of the work put in by many comrades around the world to present analysis and ideas at this conference. We hope that everyone participating or listening to this international conference has learned what is at stake and is inspired to work on these important issues. The global collaboration that went into the production of this conference serves as a deeply inspiring and concrete example of international communist solidarity. Again, we welcome you to join our movement. Thank you for your participation. In the words of our union leaders, forward together, not one step back. Hasta la victoria siempre, venceremos. Gracias. Please all rise for the internationale.